In today's video, I've compiled all of my Mega Corporation videos into one long compilation video, as many people have said they like to listen to them in the background. This will also include information on corps I haven't yet covered, such as Kang Tao and Zeta Tech, as well as some on how they went into Night City, as well as their hidden projects. So sit back, grab yourselves a drink, and enjoy some cyberpunk lore, whilst you do whatever you do. We start off with some of the lore behind how corporations came to light, and some of the early war they got involved with up until 2023. Our story starts in the early 90s, where the world was very different to our living timeline. During 1992, the US found itself within a political war later named the Quiet War against their once allies named the European Economic Community. With the Euro on the rise, America's involvement within Europe itself was less tolerated, and because of them being shut out, the EEC started to gain world power, making the US second best, and with the EEC being able to push international policies over the US's policies. To really solidify its power, the EEC wanted to make sure the US knew who they were truly dealing with, and with this defied the US's wishes and sent much needed food and aid to all of the Soviet Union states, which infuriated the US as the Soviet Union were their long-running enemy for years due to their polar opposite political views. With the food being sent to the East, the Soviets accepted the European community as their new allies, and with it accepted the Euro dollar over the US currency, and with this dramatic change in events, NATO collapsed as the Soviets had finally made peace with Western Europe, something that hadn't been possible for four decades. After this event and going into 1993, the European community was growing even further, with even a prototype mass driver being taken to the moon on New Year's 1993, showing their strength in the space program. The US had to hit back somehow as Europe was growing in all factors, especially in their military. Here they would hit them the only way they knew how, the most devastating way, through economics. Initially they would start with stock market fraud to try to disrupt military treaty talks between the Soviet and the Europeans, but eventually things came to a head with the Gang of Four, also known as the FBI, CIA, NSA and DEA, would get together to form a plan where they would show up the economic power of the EEC. Hacking into the stock market of Europe and Asia, the Gang of Four would artificially increase the stocks and promote an illusion of American wealth. This worked at first, however the EEC quickly discovered this plan by the Gang of Four and leaked it to the world press. With the world now acknowledging what the US had done, the exchange rate had been fully undermined and with it, the full system collapsed, leading to what was known as the Crash of 94. After this event, the United States were hit with hundreds of instituted embargoes in their trade relations, and with all of this happening, it was only a amount of time before the event known as the collapse. Now with limited trade opportunities and the stocks being worthless, the elderly were hit first, losing all of their pensions and investments, meaning they had no more savings and essentially became homeless and forced to move into relatives' properties. In the end, America had no way to help their finances. They couldn't lend from anyone. There was an overwhelming violence on the streets and millions in the process died. Militaries really tried to help control the violence and bring supplies to those that needed it, but in the end, it was useless. And whilst they did save many lives, it really was not enough. With the euro dollar thriving out within the rest of the world, mega corporations had essentially started to run the world and would seek out more and more property to grow their profits. The year was now 2004, and within this year, one company named Transworld Airlines, TWA, was failing as a business and needed dramatic help. One company at the time named Electronic Business Machines attempted to buy out the failing company and met with the CEO of it. The deal however did not suffice and would fall through. With this, another company named Orbital Air took this opportunity to take TWA for themselves, desperate for the TWA's air traffic facilities, and with this would go on to immediately block EBM's buyout attempt. This was quickly realized by EBM who decided to hit them back with some of the same tactics 
attacks, but this time a bit harsher. EBM would go on to hire terrorists to go on to kidnap Orbital Air's business negotiation team who were traveling to meet with TWA. But during their task, the terrorists would fail and immediately it became clear to Orbital Air that EBM was responsible for hiring them to ruin their business plans. It didn't take long for Orbital Air to step up their game once again. And after this attempted attack on their negotiation team, Orbital Air recruited a technology company known as Zeta Tech to help them in their conflict against EBM. Immediately, Zeta Tech started a large scale net attack against EBM using their finest hackers. But unfortunately for this relatively small technology company, their attacks were repelled by EBM and with their resistance forced Zeta Tech out of the war completely. Now with the nuisance that was Zeta Tech out of the way, it was finally time for EBM to start their own attacks on Orbital Air's facilities, using physical attacks and technological ones as well. Here both sides would take to using corporate solos as well as proxy soldiers from the third world to conduct these attacks, as well as using acts of terrorism, net attacks and forms of piracy. Two major battles happened during this, the first being within an EBM space station which was raided by the Orbital Air Commando successfully, but this attack brought to the attention the European Space Agency who denounced both companies and demanded that the two not fight each other within low Earth orbit. The second major battle was the one that finally ended the war between the two, which took place in the year of 2006. This saw the Orbital Air Commandos doing another successful attack on EBM, but this time on their compound which housed their CEO, Ulf Gronwalder. With his capture, EBM were forced to surrender to Orbital Air and with it, the war was officially over. This set a precedent for the rest of the world and sent a message to the other corporations. This war showed that military style warfare against other corporations was indeed a viable business practice. Whilst both companies lost hundreds of millions of euro dollars, in the end, the winning party profited from it more than they could ever have hoped. Thanks to this series of events within the years of 2004 to 2006, this was just the start of corporations fighting for profits. This had now become the era of corporate war. Fair. The year was now 2008 and the world had only just gotten over the events of the corporate war between EBM and Orbital Air. But during the final years of that war, another company had laid the foundation for what would be known as the Second Corporate War. In 2006, the company known as Sov Oil out within Eastern Europe had started producing a new fuel source that was to power vehicles. CHOOH2 was an alcohol-based fuel which was originally produced by Petrochem. Together with this new fuel, Petrochem offered Sov Oil up updated technology to help them drill, pump and create other fuels from the unused oil resources out within Siberia. But with this offer came a catch. It would see Petrochem gain partial drilling rights if they were to accept this new technology. The deal seemed to be going ahead as planned with no real problems to be seen. However, just before the papers were to be signed, the engineers from Sov Oil announced they had just developed new drilling technology that was equal to what Petrochem was offering, if not better, meaning the deal was now pointless. Sov Oil immediately cancelled the deal and suddenly a rift formed between the two companies. But as they both had their own territories, nothing happened just yet. A year passed and both Sov Oil and Petrochem looked outward to expand their empires, both looking at the South China Sea and started to move into that area. The rift the two had formed got even more hostile during this as they both sought this land and eventually that tension turned to aggression and by April 2008, the Second Corporate War had officially begun. The starting point of the war was when the offshore platform owned by Petrochem, named the Sabino Bravo, exploded. Not knowing why, Petrochem immediately accused Sov Oil of using explosives on it to remove it from the land. This kicked off a series of events which involved public verbal battles between diplomats who represented each corporation. After these hostile communications broke down, Petrochem were the first to attack using their military divers to plant explosives on a Sov Oil platform to get their equal revenge for what Sov Oil had supposedly done to them. The military divers were successful and the platform was destroyed, kickstarting full-scale warfare. Oil facilities were obviously the main target for both of them, as this was their lifeline. And with these being the targets, both sides would see huge losses in just a matter of weeks, with both losing around 75% of their oil facilities. After a year of intense fighting, Petrochem got what would be a crucial win for them in their battle. When they 
captured the Spratly Island chain and assassinated the CEO and founder of Sov Oil, Anatoly Nivakovo, utilizing military planes from the government of Malaysia. To many, this would look like an easy victory for Petrochem as they had essentially removed the head of Sov Oil. But despite everything, Sov Oil regrouped and used this loss to really hit them back and eventually were able to overpower Petrochem, endlessly repelling every attack Petrochem threw at them. With so many failed attacks, Petrochem was seriously weakened by October of 2009, and with it, Sov Oil were able to take de facto control of the South China Sea. The war was officially over and Petrochem had suffered a great defeat, forcing them out of the area. But to add to their humiliation, it was also discovered after the war ended in 2010 that the initial explosion that triggered the events of this war in the first place was not done by Sov Oil at all. In fact, it was just a rogue accident and no one was really at fault. Like with the first corporate war, the second one between these two huge oil companies really sent shockwaves all over the world. No one had really seen a conflict like it between two corporations' militaries. The amount of influence the companies could muster from the Pacific Rim countries was pretty scary, showing just how powerful they really were. And on top of all of that, both companies, especially Sov Oil, were able to place their own governments within some countries and then ignore the demands of the nation states and only focus on their self-interests. But the worst part of the war was all thanks to what they had targeted in the first place, the oil refineries. With most of them destroyed, this meant the southern part of the Pacific Rim was massively polluted, with conditions being described as all but uninhabitable by the year of 2020, forcing many to have to flee the area. Once again, two corporations had devastated part of the world and used militaries many had never seen before. But although this was the worst war so far, this was not the end, and in fact only highlighted to corporations once again that war was extremely profitable to the victors. For six years, the world was back to a somewhat normal form, with no corporations trying to take each other out. However, going into 2016, a very different war between two factions was about to take place. During a check by some examiners from the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, these individuals were going to find that there had been a confidence scheme being organized by a few investment counselors, Merrill Asukaga and Finch. These individuals would be targeting private investors and would use the Rothstein Fund as leverage. The Rothstein fund being a subsidiary of the Bank of New York City. Finding this vital information, the investigators would immediately notify the district attorney's office, who began investigating immediately the next day. Hearing about what had been going on, the Rothstein fund was furious at MANF's lack of willingness to help with the investigation, and pleading they knew nothing about what had been happening, and with it would turn in everything they had over to the DA's office. On top of that, the Rothstein fund would also hire a ton of local street netrunners to start probing their data fortresses to find what had really been going on within their company. Seeing that Netrunners were being used, MANF saw this as a direct attack on their company and immediately took action, bolstering their net defenses and also using their own private Netrunners to launch their own attack on the Rothstein Fund, targeting their financial targets first. But MANF didn't stop there and upped their attacks even further, focusing their efforts on destroying all of the Rothstein's computer systems, which would escalate things even further. With all of this happening, data fortresses became heavily armed as everyone waited to see what was going to happen next. But with all of this happening, Netwatch, the worldwide net policing organization based in London, took action and limited net access for everyone, trying desperately to crack down on computer crime. And on top of that, doing regular sweeps, which would result in numerous arrests, as well as flatlining many individuals. With the net being off limits for their attacks, both parties sought out the help of mercenaries and for a short 12-hour period, small battles took place within low Earth orbit and on Earth as they tried desperately to destroy the physical locations of their enemy's net communications gear. Despite these battles being small in scale compared to the previous corporate wars, many lives were lost during it. And on top of that, millions of euro dollars were lost in material destruction. For six months, this net war continued with many raid attacks providing no real use to either side, with it being said that the 12 hours of conflict did more damage damage to both sides than they're battling for half a year. Eventually the war came to a close as the Rothstein Fund just simply ceased to exist. For the MANF however, they were going to deliver the corpses of the two of their executives who had started this series of events over to the LADA, and on top of that, offered to pay for all of the damages caused within the LEO as well as on Earth. 
Whilst not the most dramatic of wars, this one certainly was unlike anything else, mainly using the net to conduct all of the battles. To many, it was a shock how long this war lasted considering how it all began, and many were confused by the means of warfare, believing the net being the main weapon to be very confusing. This war may not have seemed significant, but actually it was arguably the most important one as for many people, they saw this as the new form of warfare, using the net to do all of their battles. Others stated that militaries would still be used and in fact this actually changed nothing. But their questioning of the future of warfare did not have to wait long, because not long after the third corporate war had finished, a new one was just about to begin. But this one was the most devastating one anyone had ever witnessed, especially for the people of Night City. The next corporate war would be the most devastating yet and would involve two of the largest corporations the world has ever seen. These would include Arasaka and Militech, two who had honourable beginnings but lost their way as they got more and more international power. The story of Arasaka begins with Sasai Arasaka born in Tokyo, Japan in 1859. His career began when he joined the Japanese Imperial Army where he rose through the ranks to become a captain. After his retirement from the army, Sasai entered the world of business, at first as a worker and then becoming a successful businessman in his own right. During this time, Sasai met and married his wife Yui and began construction of Arasaka family compound. The compound was built in the style of a traditional Japanese fortress, perhaps indicating the focus of Sasai's future career. He wanted the compound to be a safe haven for the family he wanted to build with Yui and had made many escape routes and ways for the family to defend themselves. Shortly after completing the Arasaka family compound, Sasai set up the Arasaka Corporation in 1915. The the purpose of the corporation was weapons manufacturing which played to Sasai's strengths and previous experience of being in the Japanese Imperial Army, his business prowess and his focus on safety for his family as well. The business grew steadily and Sasai's success was enhanced when Yui gave birth to their son Saburu in 1919. The fortunes of the Arasaka family and corporation were really set to boom when the Second World War broke out. Sasai capitalized on Japan's involvement and started to supply the Japanese Imperial Navy with ships and planes. This had extra importance to Sasai as his son Saburu, now in his 20s, had enlisted as a pilot in the Japanese Imperial Navy. Saburu, like his father, quickly rose through the ranks, becoming a lieutenant at just the age of 23. However, Saburu would find World War II a far more intense experience. In the year following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, the Japanese Navy had been gradually taking Allied territories in the South Pacific. Pacific. They had captured the Philippines from the Americans, British Malaya from the British, and the East Indies from the Dutch. This was all part of the plan to isolate Australia and New Zealand from the other Allied forces. In May 1942, Japan had captured Guadalcanal on the Solomon Islands, a place where they could actually attack Australia from. The Americans, as retaliation and despite being heavily underprepared, launched Operation Watchtower, the first Allied land offensive of the Second World War. The Japanese Japanese were taken thoroughly by surprise when America conducted its first ever amphibious landing in Guadalcanal. A short battle ensued but the Americans successfully expelled the Japanese from Guadalcanal, saving Australia for the time being. Americans now had to hold Guadalcanal whilst completely surrounded by Japanese bases across the South Pacific. Saburu was stationed at one of those bases, the former Australian territory of Rabaul in Papua New Guinea. Later in 1942, Saburu Saburo was given a mission to be part of a flying escort in his A6M0 of the GM4 Betty bombers. The aim was to successfully get the bombers to Guadalcanal where they could attack the American forces stationed there, but first they would have to navigate the South Pacific Ocean where they would be completely out in the open and vulnerable to attack from the Americans. As the Japanese had feared the Americans were soon pursuing them across the Pacific and Saburo's escort was attacked by a group of Grumman F4Fs. 
Zero pilots broke formation in order to retaliate against the Americans. Sabura was able to take down one Grumman, but whilst in pursuit of another, he crossed enemy lines, taking heavy fire to his plane. The bullets smashed through the metal and perspex of his cockpit, shattering his left arm and sending shards of the plane into his face and eye. With Sabura rapidly losing consciousness due to his injuries, his plane began to nosedive the 15,000 feet to the ocean below. With just 2,000 feet to spare, Sabura regained enough consciousness to correct his plane. He had no choice with his severe injuries to attempt the 560 mile flight back to his base at Rabul, unsure that he would even make it. Sabura did make it back to Rabul and managed to report to his commander before collapsing. And with that, he was immediately transported back to Tokyo for medical treatment. When he finally regained consciousness, he was told of the extent of his injuries. His left arm had been saved, but he would never be able to use it ever again. He would have scars on his face for the rest of his life, and the damage to his left eye had left him partially blind. Saburo was told that he would never be able to fly ever again. For him, this was the ultimate failure. He felt it was dishonorable to have been medically discharged rather than have had her hero's ending and fallen in battle fighting for his country. For the rest of the war, he languished at the Arasaka family compound, ashamed of how his military career had ended. In 1945, the war ended with Japan's surrender to the Allied forces, spelling trouble both for Sasai and for Saburo. Japan's economy suffered as a result of the war ending, which would spell the end for many Japanese businesses. However, Sasai had foreseen that defeat was a possibility, so throughout the war he had been stowing his assets away overseas, which allowed his family and the Arasaka Corporation to just stay afloat after the war. Saburo, however, was devastated by his country's loss and felt there was no way he could continue in a world where Japan would not be the victor. Saburo was about to act on his despair when suddenly he was struck with an epiphany. In this epiphany, he foresaw the future and potential of the Arasaka Corporation and all that he could achieve with the company when he inherited it from his father. And not just that, how he could use his position within the Arasaka Corporation to enable his beloved Japan to return to its former glory and even rise as greater power globally than ever before. Saburo in that moment put aside the tragedy of Japan's loss and his own injuries and resolved to throw himself into becoming an effective businessman. He began by enrolling in Todai, the Imperial University of Tokyo, and studying business, politics, economics, and history. His plan was to steer the Arasaka Corporation into becoming the dominant business over all of its competition. In 1960, Sasai passed away, leaving Saburo at the age of 41 to inherit and become CEO of the Arasaka Corporation. Saburo quickly got to work enacting his vision of corporate domination by diversifying the Arasaka Corporation's reach, starting with the opening of the Arasaka Bank. Saburo predicted that Japan's economy would start to grow and wanted to be ready to capitalize on the recovery. Using the amassed fortune that his father Sasai had protected and continued to grow, over the years, Saburo had a decent capital base in which he started up his bank that would focus on corporate and business accounts. Starting small, Saburo built up the bank's capital by cleverly investing and lending to businesses that he predicted would be headed for growth in this new economically viable era for Japan. In 1970, after acquiring an extreme amount of wealth for the Arasaka Corporation, Saburo was ready to expand the family business even further by starting up his third venture. Arasaka Security. Arasaka Security had two main functions. First, to provide manpower for both corporate and personal protection, and secondly, to provide and manufacture technology for the purposes of electronic and computer security. Arasaka Security was a huge global success. Saburo had focused on creating a service of real quality. The security personnel received the best training and were the best equipped on the market, being skilled in the latest security procedures and able to hand any form 
of combat both armed and unarmed. They were also fully trained in how to handle a variety of equipment to suit Arasaka's clients' needs. Saburo knew that having such an elite and sophisticated security service would allow him to command a very high price for the loaning of such operatives. By making the service fully bespoke, Saburo allowed for a variety of people and businesses to be able to afford first-class security, maximizing the earning potential for the Arasaka Corporation. Saburo had successfully established and maintained what he called the three pillars of the Arasaka Corporation, Arasaka Manufacturing, the Arasaka Bank, and Arasaka Security. But while Saburo was expanding publicly on his father's legacy, behind the scenes he was resorting to different tactics to further the power of the Arasaka Corporation. Saburo had no problem with bribing people and finding out ways of blackmailing and extorting important figures in politics and business, even sometimes resorting to abduction and assassination in order to glean information and further his influence over people. Saburo was also using his newly founded Arasaka Security to collect secret information on his clients using spyware built into the security software he had been selling to other corporations. Saburo had no intention of selling the information he collected, rather he used the information to predict business and economic trends, allowing him to get ahead of his competition and make clever business decisions and make a profit that way instead. This information also allowed him to exploit people using his new bank as well, by knowing when his clients would desperately need a loan and being there with high interest at just the right time. Saburo was also using the bank as a front for money laundering between the Arasaka Corporation and the smaller businesses he had been gradually buying out. The corporation at this point in time was going from strength to strength. There was only one more thing that Saburo needed to solidify the growing power of the Arasaka name, an heir. And in 1980, his legacy was secured with the birth of his son, Kei. Saburo had the specific intention that Kei would one day become the CEO of the Arasaka Corporation, just as he himself had inherited this responsibility from his father. Saburo wasted no time in grooming and preparing Kei to be an effective business leader worthy of all that Saburo had achieved so far. After Saburo's wife's death, he met the beautiful and sophisticated Michiko in Kyoto. Michiko came from a wealthy family and had the distinction of having attended one of the most elite universities in all of Japan. Like Saburo, she wanted to see Japan prosper again after the losses caused by the war. Michiko didn't really know much about the Arasaka Corporation, but she fell in love with what she perceived as Saburo's noble nature and they married within a year of meeting each other. The Arasaka Corporation was going from strength to strength still, with Saburo being rewarded for his work by appearing on the Global 500 list for the first time in the early 1990s. But in 1994 was when Arasaka had to survive its first real test. In the preceding years, the Gang of Four, an American political cabal made up of the NSA, FBI, CIA and DEA, was growing discontented with the European economic community moving away from American influence. This EEC was doing increasingly anti-USA things, like sending aid to the Soviet Union, leading to the USSR accepting the EEC's currency of the Euro dollar over the US dollar, and making peace with Europe for the first time in 40 years. A consequence of this was the collapse of NATO, further diminishing the US's power and influence. The EEC was also expanding its space program which worried the US that the EEC was not just the largest economic power but could also become the world's greatest military power as well. The NSA convinced the Gang of Four that something had to be done to protect the US's status on the world stage and so they resorted to undermining the structure of the EEC. The Gang of Four started hacking into the stock market markets of Europe and Asia and skewing the figures to make the US look far more wealthy than it actually was. This plan however massively backfires. When the EEC discovered what the US and the Gang of Four was up to, they revealed all to the press. This caused an extreme lack of faith in the exchange rate between the Euro dollar and the US dollar. People panicked and the global stock market crashed in 1994. This dispelled disaster for corporations around the world, but Sabura had been 
been sneakily keeping an eye on the EEC and the Gang of Four for years, knowing exactly what was going on and using his superior business knowledge, was able to predict the crash and prepare the Arasaka Corporation to not just survive the crash, but actually profit from it. He also predicted the fallout for the US in 1996, after the EEC and the rest of the world put out an embargo on any trade with the US, effectively making the US a pariah state as Saburo took full advantage of this void in the global market. The Arasaka Corporation began buying up the businesses that had fallen victim to the crash that could be valuable assets and destroying any competition that the Arasaka Corporation had left. The security branch of the Arasaka Corporation was also expanding by building up an actual private army that was training in the forbidden waste of Hokkaido Island. Now a corporation, person or country could hire their own personalized paramilitaries for any warfare they wanted. Saburo now wanted to enact the next part of his vision from 1945, that of a truly powerful and glorious Japan. Saburo started his plan by using all of his illegally acquired knowledge to control around 60% of all Japanese politicians. However, despite his intentions to help Japan, other Japanese businesses and corporations had become tired of Saburo's never-ending ambition and how it was impacting them and Japanese people's freedom. The other businesses banded together to form the Far Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere, or FACS for short. Saburo for once was not able to ride this setback out, and the FACS successfully undermined his political control, leading to the arrest of many Japanese politicians. This didn't stop Saburo's quest for ultimate power at all. Instead, he turned his attention to the Japanese police force, completely undermining its power by creating the Arasaka Police, another sub-branch of Arasaka security alongside the Arasaka Army. Tokyo was the only city that managed to resist being taken over by the Arasaka Corporation completely. Despite one setback with his political ambitions, by the end of the 1990s, Saburo was number two on the Global 500 list. It seemed like Saburo and the Arasaka Corporation had become untouchable. And while Saburo was building up his empire, his family with his wife Michiko was growing too. Michiko gave birth to a son, Yoronobu, in 1995, and later in 1999, she gave birth to a daughter. Hanako. Sadly though, Michiko would not see her children grow up as she died as a result of complications during childbirth shortly after Hanako was born. Hanako therefore became Saburo's favorite child. Whilst he expected his sons to follow him in business and go out into the world, Saburo kept Hanako safely educated at home at the Arasaka family compound. Now approaching 20, Saburo's oldest son Kei had taken an interest in martial arts and had started training at the Hokkaido facility. Saburo was fine with his son having interests outside of business until Kei started prioritizing his training over his studies, causing an angry Saburo to force Kei to stop his training at Hokkaido and focus only on preparing to run the Arasaka Corporation. By the year 2000, Saburo was now 85 years young, but his age had become of little consequence to his ability to keep the Arasaka Corporation at the top of its game. He had used cybernetics to replace his damaged eye and arm that he had injured during the war. These cybernetics also slowed Saburo's aging, meaning that despite his political setbacks, he was fully prepared to take Arasaka Corporation into the 21st century. At this point in time, the Arasaka army was being hired out to governments across the world, such as Slovakia, Hong Kong, and also Taiwan, who needed assistance against China, who had hired their own army from Arasaka's main power rival, Militech. In 2013, Saburo decided it was time to expand into what was left of the United States, choosing Night City as the place for a new Arasaka American headquarters. Whilst overseeing the new headquarters, Saburo heard of an employee at a rival corporation called ITS, who was known as Alt Cunningham. Alt was a specialist in artificial intelligence and had developed a program that could transfer the consciousness and personality of a person into a digital form called an engram. ITS had decided to further capitalize on this new technology by getting Alt to develop what they called the Soul Killer. The Soul Killer took the idea of transferring a person's consciousness and changed it into forcibly trapping a consciousness, causing instant death of the intended target. Saburo knew that he had to have this technique 
technology to keep ahead of the competition. So he arranged for Alt to be kidnapped when she was leaving a concert with her boyfriend Johnny Silverhand. Alt was forced to replicate the Soul Killer under the direction of Toshiro Harade, the Arasaka American CEO. Meanwhile, Johnny Silverhand had incited a riot outside the newly built Arasaka Tower and later was able to storm the building. Harade knew his time was up and decided to make Alt the Soul Killer 2.0's first victim. Alt, however, was able to fend off the attack, taking out Harade's bodyguard and the Netrunner team. And when Johnny set off the bomb in the tower, Harade seized his opportunity and prepared to separate Alt's consciousness from her body. Harade was almost successful before Johnny burst in and killed him. He found Alt hooked up to the Soul Killer 2.0 and disconnected her. However, he didn't realize that by disconnecting her, he had completed what Harade had started. Alt was killed instantly, but her consciousness was forever trapped as an engram. Saburo, however, had got exactly what he wanted, a rival soul killer, regardless of the cost. With Toshiro Harade dead, Saburo appointed his eldest son Kei as the new American CEO of Arasaka. And with Yorinobu having just graduated from Saburo's alma mater Tode, Saburo felt it was time to bring him into the inner circle of the Arasaka Corporation. Saburo told Yorinobu the whole truth about how he ran Arasaka and what his vision of the future for both the corporation and for Japan was. Yorinobu, however, did not share his father's vision for the future and wanted nothing to do with Arasaka's future. He decided though to stay silent, letting his father believe that he was fully on board with him and Kei. Yorinobu left the family that same night with a plan to bring down his father and the Arasaka Corporation. After leaving that night, Yorinobu sought out a tough group of Tokyo nomads called the Bozozuku, or the Still Dragons, whose purpose was to bring down what they saw as the corrupt Arasaka Corporation. Yorinobu was able to provide the Steel Dragons with valuable insider information while still masquerading as a loyal member of the Arasaka family. His work for the corporation also allowed him to travel the world and meet other people who also wanted to see the downfall of the Arasaka corporation. After a few months of this deception, Saburo discovered what his son had been up to behind his back. Saburo was devastated at this betrayal but knew that he had to deal with Yorinobu to protect the corporation. Kei had no such sorrow and vowed to outright kill his younger brother for his betrayal. Yorinobu went into hiding with the Steel Dragons and despite Saburo wishing to protect his daughter Hanako, a bond was so strong with her brother that she would keep in contact with him once a month through the net. Following this betrayal, Saburo decided it was time for him to step down as CEO and hand the reins to Kei. However, Kei was CEO in name only, with Saburo still pulling the strings from the Arasaka family compound. The year was 1996 and an Italian weapons designer known as Antonio Lucchesi would go on to finally set up his own company in which he'd bring his designs to the world stage. Setting up this company, he would name it Armatec Lucchesi International and took a few years to get it all going. After two years of setting up everything he needed, Armatec Lucchesi International took part in some new trials of a brand new standardized US infantry assault weapon that was to revolutionize militaries of the world. As these trials continued, the US government decided that this was a thing they definitely wanted to invest in to help bolster their forces, despite still being in massive debt from the economic collapse of 1994. Eventually, three finalists from different corporations were selected, the first being the FNSAP, a cheap but clunky and unreliable weapon that seemed to be only considered due to the powerful ties between the company Fabrique International and the US government, as well as having ammunition and parts that were compatible with other members of NATO, or what was left of NATO anyway. The second gun was the Colt AR-17X, which was an incredibly good weapon in all of the testing, but was held back massively due to how expensive it was. And the third option was by Armatec Lucchesi International, which was a rifle that was considered compact, reliable, and moderately priced. As these finalists were considered, the USMC General Donald Lundy, who was overseeing the trials, quickly became wowed by the Armatec 
Armatex system stating it was the best combination of price, reliability, sturdiness, and accuracy. All seemed to be going the way of Armatex as their creation was clearly better than the rest of the competition by a long shot. However, despite all of Donald Lundy's plans to get this contract with Armatex, the US government ultimately had the final say. And due to the recovery of the US economy thanks to the crash of 1994, the contract was once again given to FN to make their extremely unreliable but extremely cheap guns for the national military. This news did not stop Lucchese's company, however, as they continued to create and sell their own weapons, but this time to more private buyers. In 2003, however, the US were sent into South and Central America once again to start their war on the supposed drug dealers who were responsible for the downfall of American society. This wasn't the true reason as to why they went in there, but regardless, the troops were there in their masses. This war was the first sign that the US's choice in cheap and unreliable weaponry was a bad decision, as thousands of soldiers were dying in the field as their weapons would clog up and become unusable thanks to the tropical conditions they were fighting in. Lundy saw how devastating this war was becoming thanks to their terrible choices made by the government. But at this point in time, he had already resigned from the Marine Corps in 1998, shortly after the gun trials, and in an act of protest, became the active CEO of Armatech at the request of Lucchese, as he could see how passionate Lundy was for his brand. Lundy wasn't just a previous member of the Marine Corps, he was also a former Pentagon chief, meaning he had an absolute ton of experience and knowledge within the modern military industry, which meant he could see which of the companies out there were becoming incredibly bureaucratically top heavy, selling extremely cheap and shoddy weapons, as well as all of the other majorly overpriced products that they could sell thanks to their many political contracts going out there. With this huge insight, Lundy was able to see a massive opportunity for more streamlined and efficient manufacturing of military products that would be able to make extremely high quality modern equipment at really affordable prices, something Lucchese showed was possible back in 1998. The only thing Lundy wanted to focus on was reaching the private market instead of just trying to tie down political contracts, allowing them to get on the global market and be essentially a household name. As Lundy came up with this pitch to revolutionize the company he had now become CEO of, he would match it with Lucchese's brilliance in weapon design, and together would allow Armatech to start boosting their capital, propelling the company into a period of huge growth and expansion. It didn't take long before the world started noticing this huge brand growing more and more all over the world with their very clear business strategy, and because of how big they had become, it was finally time for a full rebrand. The company needed to change its name to help it stand out more and become far more recognizable. With that, Militech Arms International was officially born, and their global success was at brand new heights. This success was evident within 2004 when the company saw a major opportunity all thanks to the Second Central American War. During this point in time, the US government was massively humiliated by the mass loads of losses happening out within the countries they were fighting with, so much so that their contract with FM was officially scrapped and the FN SAP rifle was no more. It had cost way too many lives, and despite it being cheap, it was still too pricey to keep going. Needing a brand new supplier for their military, the US government came crawling back to Militech and chose their new standardized military weapon, which was the Militech Ronin Light Assault Rifle. And with that, the contract was officially signed between the two, as well as another contract for a military sidearm they had created, which helped Militech see a huge growth in that specific weapon all over the globe, to both nations and corporations alike. Essentially, these guns were the gold standard all over the world. This continued on for many years, and by 2010, Militech became the largest defense contractor in several countries, which included the US. But not only that, they were the go-to for military arms by a lot of corporations who would use the weaponry to take over lesser companies and ones who were on the brink of failing, which would trigger the many corporate wars happening throughout the globe. Despite all of that, however, not all was bliss within the headquarters of Militech, as there were frequent power struggles among 
amongst those at the top of the corporation. The Lord Londy was always seen to all of the workers within the corporation as being a solid leader that could never do any wrong. He was the one to lead them into great success as he had since proven. However, the board of directors had other ideas, never seeing him in a positive light. Maybe they could see who Lundy really was, because putting it bluntly, Donald Lundy was extremely power hungry and was not afraid to show it. His sole goal for this corporation was to make Militech the largest military force on earth, something that the board members weren't too keen on. To do this, however, Lundy needed to win the corporate battle against their closest competitors, the Japanese military supplier known as Arasaka, who dominated the Eastern Hemisphere. With Lundy despising the Japanese corporation, tension between the two started getting more and more hostile, so much so that many people all over the world were worried that soon there was going to be a corporate war involving those two, and when it began, it would be the biggest they had ever seen. Because of this fear, many within Militech started disagreeing with other members, leading to a lot of turmoil in the corporation's decision making going into the next decade. As time went on, many members of Militech left to find other careers not agreeing with the direction the corporation was going in, and also to help the corporation grow even further by inserting themselves into other fields. Within 2020, for example, an ex-president of Militech known as Elizabeth Cress would go on to become the new president of the United States, helping the corporation grow even further, especially in the US, making them essentially the country's own private army that supplied them with the latest and greatest technology in case anyone were to invade them. With that said, Donald Lundy at this point in time was becoming a paranoid mess of a man, thinking that everyone was against him and that he was losing control of his own company. That was not exactly true, as many people were still extremely loyal to him. But with the board against him and Arasaka on the rise in the rest of the world, it was only a matter of time before he officially snapped. But the year was now 2023, and both Militech and Arasaka had reached their peak. And finally, it was time to engage with the competition and try to shut them down once and for all, to become what Donald Lundy always wanted, to be the largest force on planet Earth. In the year of 2021, the two rival Aqua Corps of Sino and Otek would start warring against each other in an attempt to grab the resources of another failing Aqua Corp known as IHAG. Grabbing those resources would mean the corporation that got them would become the largest underwater shipping and technology supplier in the world and could essentially run a monopoly on that market. To do this though, both corporations needed a good military to scare the other one into either surrendering or just wiping them out for good. Here, Militech's defense forces were contracted as a supplementary support for OTEC's security forces and to help them with military tactics through the use of advisors, supplying them with weaponry as well as other crucial supplies. On the other side, Sino would hire the help of Arasaka to fight their battles and supply them with their own resources, pitting the two megacorps against each other. At the beginning, however, no conflict happened between Arasaka and Militech as neither wanted to engage in direct direct conflict. Instead, both wanted to advertise and demonstrate how powerful each one were. For Donald Lundy, however, he was desperate to take out Saburu Arasaka, as he saw defeating this big corporation as a way of defeating the whole of Japan, something that he was passionate for due to links to their involvement in World War II at a guess. As the war between Otek and Sino took off, Militech and Arasaka started getting involved with covert operations and got ready for if anything got even more heated. Lundy during this time believed that Militech were officially at war, and as he was always of a soldier mindset, knew that the only way out of this war was by wiping out Arasaka once and for all, with Militech being utterly victorious. However, as 2022 came around, the ocean war between both Sino and Otek had come to an end, with a peace accord being signed on the 27th of February. Despite that, Arasaka continued on their mission on their own accord this time, developing a software named Soul Killer 2.5, which would capture the engram of anyone they wished and stored it in their database to extract as much data as possible from them. Here they would go on to use it on a Militech executive and interrogate them, officially triggering a grand conflict between the two superpowers, who were simply 
just trying to destroy each other now. With the two now warring against each other, a ton of governments all over the world tried to stop them from causing outright destruction on the many cities they inhabited. With some states in the US such as Texas and Southern California deciding to take over the corporation's facilities and nationalize them to try and teach them a lesson and stop the ever-growing conflict. Eventually the EEC threatened to get involved as well, but despite all of the worry about their ever-growing conflict, Arasaka forces went on to invade a Militech showroom within Italy, causing yet again more destruction. But this was the last straw, and finally the EEC got involved, seizing all of the assets owned by both corporations throughout the whole of the European continent. Japan also followed this despite everything Arasaka had done for them over the years, and nationalized all of Arasaka's assets within its borders and its surrounding territories. It seemed like all was lost for Militech and Arasaka as the world was fighting back, taking everything from them. However, the war would go on to reach its peak on the 20th of August 2023, where Militech would set up secret strike teams that would go on to enter Arasaka Tower from its rooftop to gather all of the vital Arasaka data from the pre-data crash, as well as the Soul Killer program. And if all were to fail or not go as planned, they would go on to deploy small nuclear weapons within Saburu's office, taking out their HQ in Night City completely. This team would consist of the legendary solo Morgan Blackhand, iconic rocker boy Johnny Silverhand, as well as his team of Rogue, Spider Murphy, and Shaitan. As this mission went ahead, lots of different stories were told about what happened within the building, but the end result was always the same. This team would set off the small nukes and completely destroy the tower and the surrounding area around it. This blast would kill over 12,000 people within the corporate center of Night City, causing a further 750,000 plus deaths in the following days due to how much radiation and debris had been flung into the atmosphere. With this attack now over, the world needed to take drastic action to make sure no attacks like this ever happened again, and these two mega corporations needed to be fully stopped now. Soon after the fourth corporate war came to an end with son of Saburu Kai surrendering their involvement, President Elizabeth Kress would go on to declare martial law throughout many different parts of the country to make sure they were under full governmental control to make sure nothing else was going to break out and cause even more chaos. On top of that, she would also go on to blame the whole attack on Arab Arasaka, stating they deliberately destroyed Night City to assert dominance and destroy America from the inside. However, despite all of these public claims, many people demanded that Militech come forward and take responsibility for their actions, knowing full well that they were the one who launched the attack, not Arasaka. Despite some of that public outcry calling for justice, President Kress would go on to take full ownership of Militech, nationalizing all of the corporation to make sure her federal rule was at full strength, and no one could could challenge her rule. For those within the top seats of Militech themselves, they were offered lucrative positions in the reformed NUS Department of Defense. Most would accept these offers. However, for their main CEO, Donald Lundy, he had become completely paranoid by this point and extremely hot-headed and objected massively to this change of his corporation. With Militech now officially a nationalized corporate asset, they would continue on as a private corporation to some extent on the side, secretly re building back to its former role as a combination of arms manufacturer and mercenary army. This was a difficult task for them as they had lost so much during their war against Arasaka, but that didn't stop them as they would continue to use their many different contacts and many experts in guncraft to remain as one of the world's largest producer and seller of an all manner of military weapons all over the world, with not many countries really caring about what had happened to them during the fourth corporate war. For Donald Lund despite his massive outbursts before and after the nationalization, he would remain as the CEO and main leader of the corporation, still being incredibly influential throughout the whole of the board of directors. That said, he technically wasn't in complete power of Militech as he did not own enough stock to control the corporation. The only reason he was able to persuade so many people was because of his fierce personality, strong allies and connections, and his incredible success record that had kept kept Militech on top for many, many years. With that said, his hatred for Arasaka had made him many enemies, not just within Japan, but throughout the rest of the world, with one being President Kress herself, who would do everything within her power to make sure he did nothing stupid and start more hostilities with Arasaka or anyone 
he actively disliked. In 2045, sadly for many within Militech, Donald Lundy would pass away, but not before he named his new son, Donald Dixie Lundy Jr., a member of the corporation's board. Many mourned the loss of this great man, paying tribute to everything he had done for this company and how he had helped them grow over the years. Despite his final years being filled with hatred and anger for how they had been pulled out of their war against Arasaka and turned into a nationalized company, his legacy and direction would forever be remembered throughout all of the Militech Corporation and his plans for the company would continue on in the many years going forward, with many of the leaders of the corporation still idolizing everything about him. Militech were quick to blame the Arasaka Corporation for the nuclear blast, saying that they purposefully destroyed their own headquarters and the data housed within it to prevent their information getting into their rival Militech's hands. The then US President Elizabeth Kress believed Militech, despite it not being determinable who exactly set the nuke. President Kress made a point of humiliating the Arasaka Corporation, revoking their right to operate in America and branding their members terrorists, forcing them to flee. The the Japanese government were also humiliated by one of their own companies being assumed to have done such a terrible thing, and in order to save the country, decided to distance themselves from the Arasaka Corporation. In effect, Kei as CEO had destroyed his father's legacy and all that Saburo had built up globally. Kei had not been in Night City at the time of the blast, so at least had survived. But whilst he was aboard his ship, the Sea Viper, he was persuaded that he failed his corporation, his family and himself and that there was only one way he could restore his family's honor. Kay agreed and that night took his own life by using his own soul killer device. Kay's death restored his honor and also ended the fourth corporate war. Yorinobu decided he should attend Kay's funeral and make peace with his father. Saburo, with encouragement from Hanako, who still cared for her brother, decided eventually to welcome his second son back into the family and the corporation. Whilst it seemed to the Arasaka family that Yorinobu Nobu had put his traitorous past behind him, it was all a deception. For despite the Arasaka Corporation being greatly diminished with the fallout from the Fourth Corporate War, they were still not completely destroyed, and with Saburo back as CEO, there was still the potential for the Arasaka Corporation to regain its former power. Yorinobu, therefore, had decided to change his methods of destroying his family's business and realized that it could only be taken down from the inside. It would take many years for Yorinobu's plans to come to fruition. By the 2040s, the Arasaka Corporation had split into three rival factions, all vying to become Saburo's next heir and take control of the company. The first was Yorinobu's faction, which he called the Taka or Hawk faction. Despite Yorinobu disagreeing with his father over how Arasaka should be run, the two were actually very similar, with both being determined to get their way and increasingly covert in their methods. The next faction called the Kiwi or Green Pheasant faction was led by Saburo's daughter, Hanako. She had been working on the Soul Killer device, believing that it had potential as not just a method of assassination, but also to transfer people's consciousness into new clones, allowing them to continue to live. Hanako very much believed in her father's vision, although Saburo was still protective of her more than he had been with his sons, so it's not clear whether she knew the true extent of the Arasaka Corporation's dealings. The third faction was led by Michiko, Kei's secret daughter, and therefore Saburo's granddaughter. After her father's death, Michiko faced deportation to Japan despite being an American citizen. Michiko managed to plead her case to stay in America to President Kress and finished her education. And when her aunt and uncle had established their two factions of the Arasaka Corporation, Michiko was approached by some Arasaka employees to form a third. She had little intention before of having anything to do with her father's family company, but in the end saw the benefits of joining the corporation and infusing it with some of her more western liberal ideas. Michiko's faction was called the Hato or Dove faction. While Shironobu, Hanako and Michiko built up support for their cases to succeed Saburu, the patriarch actually had no intention of stepping down as CEO anytime soon. This was miraculous as by this time he was well over a hundred years old. Saburu was secretly spending a lot of time in med tanks, regenerating his aging body tissue and had also began in 
investing heavily in bioengineering and mine preserving technology. Saburo had commissioned Anders Hellman to build something called the Relic Project. Like Hanako, Saburo believed that the Soul Killer device could be turned into a life preserving device as well. And that's exactly what Relic 1.0 was designed to do. A person can now keep forever preserve their consciousness as an engram that people could interact with. The technology, however, was extremely expensive and therefore the relic could only be marketed to the top 1% of wealthy people across the world. This caused outrage to most other people who believed that the relic was a way of the rich to live forever whilst being immune to any actual problems in the world, such as poverty, natural disasters and economic crashes. The relic wasn't, however, an actual way to becoming truly immortal as it was more of a safe version of a person's personality and didn't have any actual self-awareness or ability to communicate beyond basic conversation. Of course though, Saburo had another version of Relic, Relic 2.0, made in secret just for the Arasaka Corporation's inner sanctum. This version was far more sophisticated as it was able to transfer a person's entire consciousness into another organic body. This could only be achieved after a person's original body had died. The consciousness would be stored and then transferred into the host using nanotechnology. However, initial testing did not go according to plan. Whilst the consciousness could be transferred, it would never really take to its new body, which inevitably led to the failure of the biochip the consciousness was stored on. Nonetheless, Saburo persevered. Meanwhile in America, which was now pretty split into the new USA, NUSA and the free states that had been gradually separating from the NUSA since the crash of 1996, a unification war was underway. The NUSA wanted to reintegrate the free states back into being one country, but the free states and cities, including Night City, were having none of it. Saburu and therefore the Arasaka Corporation decided to publicly back Night City against the incursions of the NUSA. This improved Arasaka's relations with Night City tremendously after what happened with the nuke, and city councillor Lucius Ryan invited the Arasaka Corporation back to Night City to re-establish their American headquarters there. Arasaka and its army arrived just in time to prevent an attack by NUSA on Night City's Coronado Bay. The NUSA knew that they could not take any more losses as their situation had become unstable, so retreated from the bay and Night City was officially saved. Saburo was welcomed back to Night City and able to build brand new headquarters, but he didn't just stop there. He replaced a lot of the ruins still around from the nuclear fallout of the fourth corporate war and built up instead a port with new warehouses, hangars and autonomous assembly lines. Meanwhile, Yoronobu was still working on his plan to take down the Arasaka Corporation from the inside and was secretly working with the net policing operation Netwatch. Together they had formulated a plan to retrieve a sample of the relic project with a working engram. Whilst Yoronobu was at his father's labs in Tokyo, he seized his opportunity and stole one of the relic prototypes and specifically chose the engram that contained the consciousness of Johnny Silverhand. However, Anders Hellman was onto what Yoronobu was up to and knew that he had fled to Night City. Anders tipped off Saburo of Yoronobu's betrayal, but also rang Yoronobu and warned him to speak to Saburo before doing anything with the relic prototype and netwatch. Saburo then left Tokyo and set sail for Night City with Hanako by his side. She was the only person he trusted with the news of what Yoronobu had done. Yoronobu and Saburo had agreed to meet. Hanako though feared the outcome of the meeting and felt that either she should go instead of Saburo or she should at least accompany her father to help keep the peace between him and her brother. Saburo however insisted that he would meet Yoronobu alone. Hanako asked her father what he intended to do about Yoronobu. It was a question though he could not answer. Saburo met Yoronobu at Yoronobu's suite at the Konbeki Plaza. Unbeknownst to either of them they were not alone either. News of Yoronobu's theft of the relic prototype had spread and become of great interest to others including the mercenaries V and Jackie Wells who on the same night as Saburo's visit to his treacherous son had also snuck into Yoronobu's suite in order to steal the relic prototype for Evelyn Parker, Yoronobu's former lover. Saburo and Yoronobu's meeting quickly went sour and in a fit of rage Yoronobu lunged at his father and strangled him to death. Despite all of the bioengineering and over a century of being a formidable force in the corporate world, Saburo's 158 year life came to an end in just a few short minutes at the hands 
deeds of his own son. Yorinobu knew he couldn't waste any time. It would soon be discovered that his father had died and he had to secure his position as the Arasaka Corporation's CEO in order to continue his plan of destroying the company from the inside. Yorinobu staged Saburo's death to look like a poisoning and laid the blame on his father's bodyguard, Takimura. However, what Yorinobu didn't know was that V and Jackie Wells had witnessed the whole evening's events and knew the truth of what Yorinobu had done. Yorinobu wasted no time in sabotaging the Arasaka Corporation from the inside by immediately shutting down Arasaka facilities in parts of Japan. But outwardly, Yorinobu had to play the part of the devastated son who had just unexpectedly lost his father, particularly for his sister Hanako's sake. As a family, they, along with Michiko, decided to attend the Dashi Float Parade in Japantown and used that as an opportunity to deliver a eulogy for Saburu. However, Takimura, the bodyguard, had concocted a plan in order to clear his name and have the truth of Saburu's death be revealed. He had to talk to Hanako and get her to see what was really going on. During that parade, Takimura confronted Hanako and tried to explain that it was Yorinobu that had killed her father. Hanako, though, did not want to believe what Takimura was telling her and wouldn't listen. So Takimura decided that the only way he could convince her of the truth was to abduct her and force her to see who Yorinobu really was. Takimura had little success in convincing Hanako of her brother's guilt until V showed up, and as an eyewitness to what really happened, was able to convince Hanako of the truth. Before she was able to process this information, Arasaka soldiers burst into where Hanako was being held, having been sent by Yorinobu to rescue his sister. Hanako was returned to the Arasaka family compound and V managed to escape, but Hanako now knew that something had to be done about Yorinobu and that he had to be held responsible for killing their father. Hanako was able to contact V in secret and tasked him with acquiring a copy of Soul Killer. Hanako's plan was to go to Arasaka Tower and find the engram of Saburu and present his engram along with V's testimony to the Arasaka board to convince the board that Yorinobu was guilty of Saburu's murder. The fate of the Arasaka family and corporation was now in the hands of V and whatever they decided to do. If V went with Hanako then Yorinobu would trigger a military coup and have the entire board killed except for Hanako and Michiko. However Hanako still had soldiers that were loyal to her from her faction and together with Takemura would be able to retake Arasaka Towers. Hanako asked V to detain her brother and V eventually found Yorinobu and took the gun Yorinobu had intended to use on himself. Hanako didn't want her brother to be killed and instead decided to put the interests of the corporation first and transferred Saburu's consciousness into her brother. Saburu was in effect resurrected just in his son's body. This would ensure that once again the Arasaka Corporation would rise to its former power, its future secure. However, if V decided against joining Hanako and instead teaming up with Pan Am Palmer or her ingram friend Johnny Silverhand to storm Arasaka Tower in Night City and destroy the relic project, they would also go on to release the engram of Alt Cunningham to get her revenge on the Arasaka Tower. This would lead to Hanako's death and Yorinobu leading the Arasaka Corporation into an uncertain future. The other option is that V does none of this at all. With Hanako and Yorinobu's fate unclear, would the Arasaka Corporation survive? Would it ever be remembered as the great power when Saburo was running it at its height? Or would it be forgotten? Sasai and Saburo's legacy destroyed. By 2077, Militech still maintained its title of one of the largest manufacturers of weapons and military vehicles in the world. However, thanks to the Fourth Corporate War, found itself with more competition of not just Arasaka, who was still a massive supplier within the Eastern Hemisphere, but now the corporation of Kang Tao, who were gaining tons of new traction thanks to their creation of their own unique smart pistol that was first sold in China, but was now selling all over the world, with them holding one of their main headquarters within Night City, overlooking the other headquarters of Militech and also the newly built Arasaka Tower that stands where the old one once stood. For Militech though, they would start working closely with the American military and police agencies throughout the decades, providing all of them with high-grade weaponry and machinery, as well as the best training they could ask for. This was all thanks to them being fully nationalized, so every aspect of them as a corporation had to be for the American people and they had to give back everywhere they could 
and in this case, it was with their full arsenal. They had gained some independence within this time, however, as many of their board of directors members now held high-ranking offices within the Ministry of Defense, enabling them to pull all of their strings and help Militech grow in power, essentially taking as much from the government as the government was taking from them. This whole agreement with the NUSA government allowed for Militech to grow even further, and 60% of the corporation's contracts came directly from the president. On the side, however, Militech went into entertainment as well, as they were going to produce and release a movie named Corporate Wars the Musical, which saw many mixed reviews on its release, with lots praising the film for its story and musical numbers, and others criticizing the movie for its melodramatic plot and propaganda. Essentially, the film was set within the Fourth Corporate War, as it would go on to completely idolize General Donald Lundy, whilst demonizing Arasaka at every chance it possibly could. The plot revolved around the General's daughter, Sarah, who would go on to fall in love with a young idealist named Andrew, who would worship everything Saburu Arasaka did. During the plot, Kai, Saburu's son, would see Andrew's loyalty to him and would use him as a pawn in their operations, installing a nuclear device into Andrew's heart, which would detonate when he came to the conclusion that Arasaka had lost the war. At that same time, he would also launch a false flag operation to destroy the Arasaka Tower to push all of the blame on Militech. However, the plan failed as the detonator never went off, leading to Kai killing Sarah himself, breaking Andrew's heart, and then finally leading to the detonation going off. By the ending of the film, Andrew, moments before his death, would go on to realize that he had been played by Arasaka and he was just a pawn in everything they did. And because of this blind, stupid decision of joining Arasaka, he had lost everything. Essentially, the film was a big statement that said if you did join Arasaka, you will be part of the enemy as they are extremely evil. And if you do join them like Andrew did, you will lose everything. So it's not surprising many saw this as blatant propaganda. Over in Night City within 2077, Militech was considered the second biggest and best corporation to work for, where all of the employees would be given up to 50% discount of all Militech weapons and supplies, and most likely free tickets to watch the Corporate Wars the musical as many times as they liked as well. Some other Militech soldiers would also be based out within the area of Pacifica known as Dogtown. These soldiers would be the remaining troopers from the Unification War who were almost sent in to attack the whole of the city to force them into the new United States that President Myers was trying to achieve. Eventually, Arasaka would enter Night City to defend them from these NUSA forces, and as soon as they did, Myers would retreat all of them from the area. Some, like these Militech troopers in Dogtown, would remain, keeping an eye on all things going on within the area, and maybe doing some dirty work for Myers that was kept completely confidential. However, that is a story to be explored at a later date. As the year progressed on, President Myers would announce that she was running for yet another term as president of the NUSA, despite all of her warring years trying to force states into being part of her rule, devastating many with bombing runs and troop attacks. Many people definitely didn't take kindly to her decision of running again, as they knew she could bring about more chaos to the whole of America. That said, she had been a CEO of the Militech Corporation for many years before becoming president, and with many members of the board being higher-ups in the Pentagon, it was seen within Militech's interest to keep her in power, as with her in power, they would grow even further and gain even more assets. The people of the NUSA, despite having some of the best protection in the world, were not too crazy on having Militech's involvement in the running of the country, with Washington DC serving as Militech's largest consumer. But with that said, if the capital ever ran out of money, Militech as a corporation would lose everything as well, meaning the people would be free from their control, but at the same time, their country would not have any money, so not really an ideal situation. The most recent thing Militech has done within 2077 is come up with a new plan to expand their corporation up into the stars and construct a new colony on Mars. Here they would start selling residential modules all over, and if they were to dominate this red planet, who knows what would happen going into the later years of the 21st century. To this day, Militech are still seen as an incredibly powerful force, albeit 
extremely controversial, with many of their scandals being exposed to the masses. Since their attack on the Arasaka Tower in 2023, Militech have been noted as an ethically shady corporation who do blatantly illegal black op missions to take out their opposition or anyone that goes against their clients. These include hiring out their private military to support revolutions, military coups, assassinations, terrorist attacks, and ethnic cleansings. In 2077, Militech was caught massacring innocent citizens of the NUSA, with 75% of the victims being identified as Japanese. President Myers also likes to use Militech as a way of making sure foreign intelligence is shut down very quickly, be that through suspicious trade links, untrustworthy foreign delegates, or just anyone who seems to be anti-government. In the end, Militech is whoever you want them to be. They have the best military out there, the best equipment, and will do any job you require if you have the right amount of eddies, regardless of if it is illegal or extremely unethical. What was once just a simple gun manufacturer has now turned into one of the biggest corporations the world has ever seen, with so much power that they are essentially their own country, pulling the strings from within the NUSA to solve any issues they see fit. Under the leadership of Donald Lundy, they have grown more and more selling some of the best weapons you could ever see, and no matter where you are in the world, you can guarantee that someone in your neighborhood will own a Militech firearm. Where Militech will be going into the 22nd century, no one knows yet. They will either grow more and more and dominate not only Earth, but Mars and space as well, or something will happen. That means they will fall dramatically, taking out every vital asset possible, which would most likely include the NUSA as well. But that story will have to be for another day. Militech would also later go on to reveal that they have been secretly active within Night City itself, starting back in the 2020s, working on terrifying projects to counter Arasaka's superweapon of the Soul Killer. This would all take place below the area that was to be the Pacifica region, where deep underground Militech would start developing an underground city secretly named Project Sinoshore. The idea behind it, based on the very limited data that is out there, was that it was a research facility to help Militech netrunners dive into the deepest regions of cyberspace beyond the black wall that was set up after the data crash way back when and capture the so-called rogue AIs to be most likely used as weapons in their future wars against other corporations who might threaten them like Arasaka for instance making it clear that if Arasaka were to use their soul killer on a grand scale Militech would have something to counter it. This facility was huge housing hundreds of workers all who were developing in this impressive core, forging AI prototypes to use in battle and spying on operations all over the globe. And all of that right under the noses of the people of not only Pacifica, but Night City itself. However, despite all looking like it was going well to some extent, this project would be pushed to its limits as the fourth corporate war kicked off between both them and Arasaka. Time went on after the Holocaust event, Militech started losing control within their secret facilities. The AIs, it was reported, had started taking over, destroying some of the Netrunners and their equipment and sabotaging all of the data collected. Not only this, this, but Netwatch had gotten word about Netrunners breaking into the old net and going way past the black wall and started to take action. It is unknown what was the specific reason for why Sinoshore closed. It could have been due to how deadly the rogue AIs they had captured were or due to the heavy Netwatch presence. But regardless, the underground facility was shut down and abandoned, with all of the Militech equipment still remaining there, as well as the rogue AIs still there somewhere within their technology. This was to all get worse a few years later as the investors who were looking to build up the Pacifica area as a tourist destination rolled in and the construction began. Whilst working, the contractors would uncover the abandoned labs and suddenly were forced out of the area with investors claiming it was due to a sudden dangerous gas leak as well as bad documentation on local developments and unexploded ordnance from the fourth corporate war. Thanks to this, Militech moved in instantly to secure the area to make sure no one saw the underground facilities and erected a wall around the area and stopped construction for a time anyway. It was also revealed later that during the Unification War, some of Militech were outraged at what President Myers had done, not agreeing with the signing of the treaty at all, and because of it, founded their own area. 
once colonel of the NUSA, Kurt Hansen, by this point was outraged at what his president had done, signing away everything he and his forces had fought for. Essentially, he believed that he had been betrayed by his own president, and now they looked weak to everyone. With that, he turned his back on the NUSA, stuck a middle finger up at Rosalind Myers, and stayed within Night City with his loyal troopers, taking over the area he had been fighting within, knowing full well that the NCPD were too scared to venture into it, and turned it into his own new area that was already walled off thanks to Militech's antics back in 2020. Setting up here with his once Militech troopers, he would go on to name them as the Bargast, after the legendary dog that would terrify the populace, and with them all ruling the area, it would go on to be named as Dogtown. With this new area set up, Kurt would go on to hoard all of the equipment that was left there during the war, such as guns, Militech tanks and submarines, and sell them on the black market to enable his forces to gain a monopoly and enough power to do what they want, so much so that even the politicians and corporate owners of Night City would turn to him for help. During Arasaka and Militech's constant attacking of each other, destroying pretty much everything in their way, other corporations would go on to try and stay away from the conflicts and build their own empires to some extent. One mega corporation during this, known as Biotechnica, would put on the front that they were in fact trying to build a better world for everyone, and because of that PR they put out there, became known as the good guys of the corporate world. This was in fact not particularly true, as they were just as corrupt as all of the others. Biotechnica's origin story starts like many other corporations within the cyberpunk universe, setting up within the early to mid 1990s. Biotechnica originated out of Rome, Italy, and was a very small company at first, looking into future technologies mainly involving food produce and how it can influence things like fuel. Being a company of mainly scientists, they would only have the one office in the early years, but luckily their claim to fame was right around the corner as the whole world was suddenly plunged into an energy crisis due to oil reserves running out, wars happening out within the Middle East, and financial collapses in multiple big countries. With the world now looking for an answer to this energy crisis, Biotechnica started working on a solution, investing everything they could into this project. Here they would find and work with a wheat product, genetically modifying it, and eventually create it, the Triticum vulgaris megasuavis, which amazingly could be adapted into a new fuel source that was the answer to all of the world's problems. With this essential wheat, the company would go on to create the new oil known as Chu2 that was massively promoted as the next stage in human innovation, a fuel source that was made completely through genetic engineering. This did bring about a new problem for Biotechnica, however. This Chu2 fuel was so popular that within just a few years, all fuel burning vehicles and power plants had converted to use it and were going through it at a rapid pace, knowing that it could just be made over and over and there wasn't a limited reserve of it, unlike natural oil. But for Biotechnica, they simply did not have the wheat reserves or land to make all of this Chu2. They needed to adapt and create more farms to harvest this wheat, because the Chu2 formula could not be made with another wheat apart from the T. vulgaris plant. Instead of actually opening their own Biotechnica farms all over the world, Biotechnica went on to license out the formula for the fuel source to any potential corporations who wanted to produce it for themselves, allowing them to gain a massive profit, but also to help them with getting Chu2 to spread all over the world. Here the mega corporation of Petrocam was the first to jump on this brilliant new venture as they went on to purchase the rights to make it and with that Biotechnica had established itself on the grand stage and Chu2 was the new standard for all gas stations around the world. A few years after first selling their new formula to Petrochem, Biotechnica would then go on to sell the formula to 14 other manufacturers around the world including Sov Oil but they were a little late to the game as Petrochem had really seized this opportunity and with how early they bought into this new fuel source were now responsible for 60% of the world's supply as they realistically owned the largest amount of soil to grow the yeast needed for production. By this point in Biotechnica's history around the late 1990s, this small company from Rome, Italy had now enough resources in their bank to be officially labelled as a mega corporation, making deals with other megacorps all over the world and setting up many new offices. Arasaka became one of the big names that Biotechnica 
Biotechnica made a deal with, which went under the radar of many people. By this point in their history, Biotechnica could focus their scientists on anything they wanted that would essentially make them a profit. Arasaka saw this and got them to make a mutual agreement, which would consist of Arasaka providing them with troops to protect their resources, CEOs, land, whatever they needed, and in exchange, Biotechnica would provide them with biological weapons that were state of the art and were way more advanced than their enemies, helping them continue to expand their corporate empire under the rule of Saburu Arasaka. As the now mega corporation moved into the 2000s, they would start working on bright and bold discoveries. However, with that said, their second biggest discovery was quickly kept secret from all prying eyes due to it being seen as illegal in the majority of countries. This discovery was made within 2004 thanks to the scientist Francis Young, who would be the first person to successfully clone humans in some unethical experiments. These experiments really didn't get to the high point of clones being self-aware and fully functional with a constructed personality until the year of 2020, however. But the process and the origins started here within the year of 2004. At first, these experiments were primarily artificial, but as more and more went on, these scientists working on the secret discovery would start inserting natural digitized personalities into the clones, a similar technology that would later go on to be the foundation for the secret super weapon Arasaka would house, known as the Soul Killer. Unknown to many, this whole cloning facility would be located within Night City itself, housing a full R&D department consisting of over 200 scientists and security, working in secret making sure no one got a glimpse of what they were conducting. With that said though, it was most likely known to the big dogs such as Arasaka and Militech what Biotechnica were up to, and were keeping track of their ongoing processes, not caring one bit about how unethical and illegal this whole discovery was. But despite what they were doing here within this cloning facility, breaking every law of America and many other countries, Biotechnica had a reason for why they were doing this, and to many, it would be seen as a positive thing and not really unethical. If it was revealed what their actual goal was with this cloning process, it might have been accepted by the many governments around the world. This true goal of Biotechnica was to bring back flora and fauna that had been wiped off the face of the earth or altered massively during the 1990s thanks to the major changes of climate change. This did become the main public image of Biotechnica at this stage as they would be known as the corporation that was trying to make a difference and bring back the green planet humans once lived on. Holding facilities all over the world, the Biotechnica teams would have this focus on the bringing back of natural resources that were long gone and to make the environment great once again. By the late 2000s, this research was shown to the world as being worthwhile, as the corporation would go on to create a natural park in Night City that would be known as Lake Park. Rich in man-made fauna, it was a place for people to go to relax and escape from the fast chaotic nature of the neon city around them. With this creation, Biotechnica had a massive PR boost as people loved this corporation and what they had achieved in just over a decade. But it didn't stop there. To end this new decade, the corporation also went on to bring back extinct animals that had been wiped out due to climate change. And suddenly, these newly brought back animals became widely sought out by the rich who wanted to go on to keep them as pets in their luxury houses and apartments, once again earning Biotechnica a massive profit, solidifying their status as a mega corporation. As the world went into the 2020s, the fourth corporate war would be seen to many as the most destructive war the world had ever seen. And ultimately, everything Biotechnica had worked on trying to get the environment back into a more stable state had been completely ruined. As the war kicked off in 2021, Biotechnica, despite having corporate links with Arasaka supplying them with biological weapons, remained as neutral as they possibly could, which enabled them to be kept away from the battlefields. And their offices and headquarters were left untouched by both sides. Funnily enough, the only way Biotechnica could remain neutral was by supplying both behind each other's backs with weapons and other biological equipment, which once again would be seen as massively unethical to many people. But for the CEOs of the Megacorp, it helped them to gain a massive profit during the war and also kept them away from any harm. If anything, it was absolutely genius of them and it worked because still to this date, both Arasaka and Militech have a good relationship with Biotechnica and continue to do 
do business with them. That said, Arasaka still did get some extra bonuses due to their previous contracts with them. What those items were, only Biotechnica and Arasaka know, but it might have given Arasaka the upper hand in their conflicts. Ultimately though, it wasn't to help them, as Militech would go on to annihilate them completely by nuking their Night City headquarters, killing over 12,000 workers and forcing them to surrender the war to save them and Japan from being massively humiliated on the world stage and ultimately collapsing forever. After this major event, Biotechnica went relatively quiet, as did a lot of the corporations of the world, as the focus went into rebuilding all of the devastated countries that were hit by the Fourth Corporate War, including Night City, which had been one of the most affected out there. With the corporate plaza being rebuilt in the following years, Biotechnica would go on to construct their new American headquarters building in the heart of the city center, standing tall next to all of the other mega corporations' headquarters. On top of that, Biotechnica also started investing in properties and relaxation resorts for paying customers, constructing the Biotechnica Hotel just outside their main headquarters, a luxury hotel that would have bedrooms filled with fauna and natural feelings. It would provide paying customers with a relaxing place to stay that would overlook the main neon city center and would absolutely not disappoint. The corporation also went on to set up a second hotel during the construction of the Pacifica region. This hotel was to be something absolutely special as it would contain a beautiful main hall containing man-made fauna again and tons of natural light filling the building. The massive windows would also overlook the badlands outside of Night City which would be exactly where the corporation's protein farms would be, essentially advertising how big their production scale is and how much protein the corporation produces in just Night City alone, going with the idea that people will want to see where their meals come from. It would also seem that Biotechnica invested in part of the Terracognita Park, displaying some of the beautiful fauna and best parts of the natural world here in a building known as Organotopia. Whilst it's not confirmed that Biotechnica is behind the whole exhibition, it certainly seems to be something they would embrace, and what better way to show off their technology and their creations than bringing it into a nice technological exhibition area in the heart of the Pacific tourist area. This Biotechnica Hotel and Terra Cognita exhibition, however, would never see the light of day, thanks once again to the Unification War kicking off within the late 2060s, launched by President Rosalind Myers. Worrying that their precious investments could be destroyed by the ruthless president of the NUSA and her militaries, Biotechnica, along with a lot of other big corporations, pulled out all of their investments in this area and left behind their constructions to just rot away, believing they were going to be just destroyed in the Unification War anyway. The war, however, did not take place in Night City, and unfortunately for all of the corporations who upped and left, their precious constructions were now the properties of the homeless and gangs who had moved into the area and made Pacifica a completely lawless land. The Biotechnica Hotel after this got completely taken over by the gang known as the Voodoo Boys, who would use it as their new hotspot to start their illegal net running projects behind the prying eyes of Netwatch, who were desperate to get anyone who might be breaking net law. With life in Night City back to a somewhat form of normality now, with the Arvin Accord being signed and the Unification War coming to an end, Biotechnica used the 2070s to go back to where they were a few years back, focusing on rebuilding the environment, which included the restoration of forests and bioengineering previously extinct animals across the world to not only continue to sell to their rich clientele, but to also help with the ecosystems they were now rebuilding. On top of all of that, the corporation was now also focusing on helping the people of the world by providing them with new vaccines for various diseases and viruses, and future medicine products that would help combat the new environmental risks caused once again by climate change. To do this, Biotechnica needed to utilize the many farms they owned out within the world, but this came at a cost to the farmers living there. Mainly within North America, Biotechnica started upping their fees for crop licenses massively. Essentially, it was an extortion scheme that was to deplete the budgets of small farms, forcing them to sell their land to the best bidder, which in this case would have been Biotechnica. This would lead to small peaceful protests at first, but Biotechnica's response to this was to just up the fees even more, and it was rumored that the corporation also unleashed a virus that decimated all of the crops grown on those farmers' land, a virus that was grown from the corporation's own labs. With this reaching boiling point, the small farmers started their own new organization to hit back against Biotechnica, and with it formed into the Crimson Harvest. This group grew more and more as the corporation took over more and more land for themselves, chucking out all of the innocent farmers just looking to live and grow produce. 
but the Crimson Harvest were not a nice group despite coming from innocent pasts. This group would go around targeting any and all Biotechnica facilities and employees, harassing them, beating them, and even murdering them in some of the bloodiest incidents the world had ever seen, helping them become labelled as an official terrorist organisation. This allowed anti-corpo individuals to join the ranks and make them bigger in numbers, but many who joined it to hit back against the corporation of Biotechnica only realised it was not going the way they wanted, and now their overall message had been lost to just blind hatred and anti-corporate rhetoric. Whilst Biotechnica worked on their medicine and vaccines for the people of the world, this would not always go well for them, as one individual known as Sasha Yakovleva would lose hers and her sister Stella's mother, Galina, to some horrible side effect from the corporation's latest painkillers. Taking this to heart, Sasha would jump to action when her crew run by the edge runner known as Maine would be offered a contract to infiltrate the Biotechnica Night City headquarters to extract vital secret financial records about Chu 2 as well as one of their latest projects, a new immunosuppressant prototype known as 0.091. As the team broke in, Sasha would not only find the information they were hired to find, but also information on the painkillers her mother had died to, known as Securacine. It was made clear to Sasha finding this that these painkillers were not fit for human consumption, as they were known to cause gradual neurodegeneration. But Biotechnica saw the financial potential of these painkillers and knew they were too profitable to not release into the wider world, and instead of pulling them for more research, they would just release them without care of the consequences. Sasha knew she she couldn't just sit back and accept this and told herself this was her opportunity to do right for her mother and started to upload the entire Securacine database file to the Network 54 News tip line. But whilst doing it, Maine's communication jammer went down and Biotechnica were quickly on Sasha's tail, sending in a group of security robots to her location. Setting up a perimeter, Sasha tried to hold them back but knew she was not going to make it. Biotechnica were going to get her for exposing their secret information. Cutting off communication from her crew, Sasha held out as long as possible to help make sure all of the data was transmitted and once it did, sadly for her, Sasha was shot, triggering the explosives she had set up, blowing up the entire office she was in. Maine would later find Sasha's body on the top of a car outside completely lifeless and said their final goodbye to their loyal Netrunner. But whilst Biotechnica shut down Sasha, she had exposed their extremely damaging drug of Securacine to the whole of Night City, hitting them with some really damaging PR, shocking quite a few people who saw that Biotechnica put their profits first before human life. Despite all of that backlash, Biotechnica continued on as if nothing had happened, setting up more and more protein farms all over North America and the rest of the world with sites like that within the Badlands just outside Night City. With all of these areas, their food production was growing as well, producing synthetic protein derivatives on a mass scale, and because of it became the base product for much of Night City's food source. On top of that, it would go on to keep a positive PR with many working within its ranks, offering its employees up to six paid vacation days a year, which might not seem like much at all, but to some people working for other corporations, this was a dream. Within the year of 2077, the corporation is considered the third biggest and best place to work within Night City. Biotechnica in this same year got so large in terms of its global status, resources and land, that even the nomad group known as the Aldecar under the rule of Saul Bright started negotiating with them to have his whole clan work for them to help keep them surviving out there in the world. Saul wanted his clan to do their farm work for Biotechnica in exchange for equipment that would allow his clan to grow crops out within the inhospitable lands of the Badlands and with it became far more self-sufficient. Despite the good intentions however many of the Nomad clan were, and rightly so, extremely worried about what it would mean for their future, essentially believing that siding with Biotechnica would mean the Aldecados would now be corporate owned, which went against everything they stood for, even if it meant they could have a food source that could be grown all of the time, regardless of environment around them. Because of this backlash Saul faced, the deal with Biotechnica did not go ahead, and luckily, the Aldecados kept their independence. Within the heart of Night City, however, Biotechnica's latest actions started to raise some eyebrows, once again involving the nomad community. Despite having such a good public image for years on end, this event really made people question 
question who they really were behind their closed doors. In a project named Project Nightingale, a biotechnical team consisting of Dr. Johanna Koch, Alex Pushkin, and Diana Kuno would go on to capture multiple members of Red Ocha Nomad Group to use them for scientific research, using them as test subjects for biological weapons and other creations, and because of this, killed over 70 of their clan members. Coach would go on to claim her research was related to antibiotic developments, but many others claimed it was simply her poisoning them. Dr. Isaac's son from Biotechnica would go on to perform autopsies on the bodies of some of the deceased clan members, stating they had died due to electromagnetic overstimulation, along with abnormal changes such as drastic neurologic growths. Even after the autopsy was over, handling the bodies proved to be quite dangerous as one Biotechnica employee, Brandon Murphy, would go on to lose an arm just coming into contact with one of the victims. It was unknown why exactly this whole project was so brutal or why Biotechnica wanted to go down this route, but according to an investigation launched by Manuel Mendoza, he would note that Militech was a possible lead into why this whole project went ahead. In those same notes, he goes on to write, possible soldier immunity testing, chemical weapon or genetic modification, and maybe there were some previous experiments done just those times on foreign soil, as well as many other things. Granted, these were just theories about what was happening in that project, but it did seem like this was not the only case of these tests, and it did seem like Biotechnica were hired by another big corporation to do these tests. With these experiments being known to the other members of the Nomad group, they would ignore any attempt at forgiveness by the doctor, and instead contacted Dino Dinovich to have her killed, in which Dino contacted the famous Merka V to get this done. At this same time, however, Dr. Coach would also issue a kill order, utilizing Biotechnica security to have her colleague Amelia Morton wiped off the face of the earth, as well as shutting down Manuel Mendoza to make sure no one could expose these tests that Biotechnica had done on the poor members of the Red Ocha clan. This wasn't the only shutdown mission either. Since the Crimson Harvest had formed, they had been committing horrific terrorist acts, with one being within Paris, which would go on to kill not only members of the organization, but ordinary residents, as well as passing tourists. Nell, who would be a member who was part of this bombing event and was filled with tons of guilt, claiming she did not want innocent lives to be killed in this attack and wants to do anything to make up for their crimes, reached out to Mr. Hans to find a merc that could help her on her quest. Unfortunately for her, Biotechnica were quickly on her heels and despite getting the job done, arrived on the scene to arrest her for killing innocents in the terrorist attacks within Paris. It would be up to V whether Nell would live and try and lead a new life free from her past sins or to turn her in and accept whatever Biotechnica were going to do with her. Either way, Biotechnica would not forgive an act like this and will either take care of Nell themselves or put out another hit on V to make sure they will be silenced as well. In the end, whilst Biotechnica is a green corporation that has done a lot of good for the planet, such as setting up man-made parks filled with fauna, as well as alternatives for food sources and bringing back tons of animals for uses as pets and for the ecosystem, it's safe to say that they are as corrupt and power hungry as any other corporation, willing to go the extra mile to silence individuals who want to expose their experiments or just talk bad about them on a public stage. If you ask the Crimson Harvest and the Red Ocha, I'm sure they'll make it perfectly clear that Biotechnica are a barbaric mega corporation who do not care about anyone other than their CEOs and their profits, and everything they do is simply for profit, not to take care of the planet at all. What the future holds for this corporation is yet to be seen. However, their goal to make the environment better for the future of mankind certainly does seem to be something they really strive for. Their human cloning process is still pretty secret to the people of the world, and maybe one day that will come to light, working hand in hand with the other projects of the megacorps, such as Arasaka with the Relic, to bring back people from the dead and put them into their own unique bodies. That certainly would be something that many people would not be comfortable with, but maybe it will go down really really well. We would just have to wait and see. With Biotechnica doing their own thing out there in the world and Militech and Arasaka only focusing on themselves, one corporation would go on to rise because of it, completely blindsiding the other gun manufacturers and pushing forward their new line of weaponry, this being Kang Tao. 
Kang Tao all started in the 1990s, but never rose to international status like that of Arasaka. Originating within China, this corporation became one of the lucky ones who were not bought out by the massive Japanese corporations looking to take everything for themselves. With this, Kang Tao remained massively independent, basing themselves within Taiwan, and continued making its small firearms, which was widely successful, but once again not to the extent of Militech and Arasaka. Within Asia, however, Kang Tao's pistols were extremely popular, mainly amongst gangsters who wanted a reliable and inexpensive brand. This continued for a good while until the time of the data crash when things got so bad for the corporation that the CEO of Kang Tao at the time committed suicide, most likely due to how much he owed or having some part in the crash itself. By the fourth corporate war, things didn't get much better for this corporation as all of Asia was affected massively due to Arasaka's actions, especially within China. But with the war now officially over with Arasaka's surrender, this was an opportunity to rebuild once again without the worry of one corporation taking over everyone. In 2046, Kang Tao appointed their new CEO, a former army colonel, Ximing Zhu, to try and restructure what was labelled as an obsolete and collapsing corporation that was only being kept alive due to government subsidies. Amazingly, Ximing Zhu was able to turn the corporation around completely and by 2050 it was completely debt free, all thanks to the release of their brand new A22B Chow Smart Pistol. Seeing the potential in this, the government who were extremely connected to the brand put everything into them and invested heavily in modern research facilities, rapidly expanding the smart weapon market. This paid off massively as over the next 20 years, Kang Tao massively outdid its main rivals and rose to the top of the market of gun manufacturers, putting it now with the big boys of Arasaka and Militech. And by 2072, it went on to triple its stock value, making it the leading weapons exporter in Asia, putting it above Arasaka, which many thought was impossible. By 2077, Kang Tao were on top of the game. However, out within Hangzhou, one of the company's refinery facilities, a massive explosion would happen, wiping out tons of their resources, as well as 50,000 of their workers and innocents. Officials cleared Kang Tao of any wrongdoing, saying they weren't negligent. However, the public knew they were responsible, and now tension became bitter amongst them. Ignoring the ongoing criticism, Kang Tao looked to move into Night City, wanting to buy up the Pacifica district. The council met with Kang Tao about this request, and explained that they would be able to buy it for a cheap price. They would have to clear out the area of all crime first. This request is still going on to this date, as Kang Tao has not even attempted to take the area by force. Maybe that's due to Kurt Hansen's crew, as well as the Voodoo Boys, or the fact that Kang Tao realized it would not be cost effective to rebuild the whole area once again. Regardless, Kang Tao has set up their headquarters within the center of the city, and to this day is the fourth largest corporation within Night City. Along with Kang Tao, another corporation blew up massively after the Fourth Corporate War, mainly thanks to how many had been affected by what had happened within it and in the aftermath. This now mega corporation would be known to all as Trauma Team. The corporation of Trauma Team isn't actually a primarily Night City based corporation. Instead, the trademark of Trauma Team International now currently spreads throughout most of North America, with its headquarters being based within Seattle, Washington. This team currently also now has locations based within, as mentioned, most cities in North America, Tokyo, and of course, Night City. Originally found within Seattle before the year of 2020, this corporation noticed that there was a real gap in the market for personal medical assistance, and now as America was suffering more more and more violence due to a wide variety of things, such as the data crash, the rising gang warfare and nomad clans, and the many wars America wanted to get themselves involved in to benefit from different trade routes and all, such as the Central American Wars, this was the perfect time for them to set up. As Trauma Team International did set up, violence and crime rates rose massively within the United States, and because of that, this corporation became easily one of the most powerful within all of America, gaining clients almost every second. This immediate rise in power allowed them to 
and then spread into Canada, parts of Europe, and then eventually reaching into Japan. By the year 2020, over a dozen trauma team crews would be sent into major cities at a time to help with the injuries and deaths by natural causes, which was honestly quite rare, and crime-related deaths. As trauma team went on to set up within Night City, they would build a large medical hospital within Little China, within the Watson district, which would also give the public access to its own Night City Area Rapid Transit service, which ran from the Med Center to other parts of the larger city. These members of Trauma Team are indeed some of the best paramedic techs and staff money could buy from all over the world with no money being spared within this corporation, and many people really respected them when they'd see them on the streets. With all of that said, it sounds like the most perfect medical system you could ask for within a city, and most will probably think they'd want them in theirs without hesitation. However, Trauma Team hasn't gotten to where they are today without asking their clients to pay a pretty penny for their services. Within the 2020s, the trauma team business model was said to be split into three types of coverage. The first was the full body life coverage, which would either cost the client €500 Euro per month or €5,550 Euro a year. With this, you would get full access to trauma team. However, if you were to call them out to help with your condition, you would have to pay a further €100 Euro for every minute they were out on your call, and that would not stop ticking away until your arrival or their arrival at the nearest corporate med center. With that said, Trauma Team, with this package for example, would not be obliged to actually take you to a hospital or med center. Here they would be responsible for reviving and stabilizing your condition, even if that was you being critically wounded. And once that was done, if you were not on a good enough package, they would just leave and bill you once they got back to the med center or hospital. On top of that, if a Trauma Team is sent into an area in which they would have to use their weaponry, the client who called them out would also have to refund them for all the ammunition they used, as well as the fuel they used to get there and any equipment and personnel damage. Whilst this is the most popular service for the people within their cities, there is one benefit they can have if Trauma Team do not get there within 10 minutes, and that is the customer will receive 50% off of the cost of spent ammunition. So whilst you could have lost your life thanks to them being late, at least you will not have to spend an absolute fortune on their ammunition. Instead, your corpse will only be charged 50% of it, and who will pay it? It doesn't really matter. That's for you to sort out or your closest relatives anyway. The second coverage within the 2020s was one called corporate coverage or the more expensive corporate executive coverage, which would cost the customer €1,500 per month or €16,500 a year for the corporate cover and €12,000 per month or €120,000 a year for the executive cover. With this plan, you are guaranteed a response time of just seven minutes. And when the team arrive, they absolutely will take you to the corporate medical center, but the client will still have to pay for equipment or personnel damage for the regular corporate cover anyway. For the executives, they will not have to pay a penny for any of this. However, paying 12,000 euro dollars a month, I don't think anyone would expect you to. The plan above, however, is known as the high priority coverage, which will set you back 34,000 euro dollars every month. And due to how expensive this service is, there is no yearly charge. It is only monthly, maybe due to the nature of the people taking this cover out. With this plan, the client who takes it out will gain the Gold Trauma Team Inc. card and will be guaranteed a response time of three to five minutes, which they claim is the fastest in the business. On a call out, the client that needs picking up and care will be collected and taken not to a med center, but to a corporate hospital instead. Luckily for the client, they will not have to pay for any ammunition and fuel used when they come to collect them. However, surprisingly, they will still have to pay for any equipment or personnel damage. So really what made these plans different within the 2020s? Well, two small things, response time and location of where the client goes. The ones who paid more are more likely to survive any critical condition and will be taken to a luxury bed to recover. Whereas those who are lower in the benefits will more likely or not bleed out on the street and even if they are recovered, will just be left there on the street. This time with some bandages and with their heart beating again. By 2022 and 2023, the fourth corporate war had taken place and for the trauma team this was their busiest period they had ever experienced which could be seen as a good thing financially however they were struggling massively because of the war and their resources were becoming very limited with so many calls coming in almost every minute the corporation had to change up their policies to make sure the right people were being seen to due to the nature of the war being started by both corporations of arasaka and militech trauma team declared that they would take absolutely no calls from either side this could have been seen as a way to show their neutrality to make it so both 
both corporations kept them in their good books for when the war comes to an end. This allowed Trauma Team to focus only on civilian requests, but with a new catch. This was the combat rate. If anyone so much as fired a weapon within half a kilometer of their premises, they would be charged for it, and quite substantially as well. Despite this new policy focusing only on civilians and adding new charges to their finances, Trauma Team still struggled within the corporate war as the calls were mounting the more battles that were happening all over the world. By 2045, the long fourth corporate war had finally come to an end, and fortunately for the trauma team, they had survived it. But it had meant that they had to only focus on regional areas instead of full international cover. This was because the war had devastated their suppliers, and as a result of this, repairs for their AV4s were becoming hard to come by, as well as things like medical dressings, key drugs, vaccines, and trained personnel. With more and more hospitals and clinics collapsing due to the lack of resources and funding, quite a lot of patients who were still ill or were wounded would find their plans with the trauma team changed to just the basic rate. Most of the reasons were due to the fact that many of the ill and injured individuals could not afford the high response fees that had more than likely gone up due to how high in demand they had become. Despite that, however, it was reported that many edge runners would go in on to buy single trauma team cards that they would then break into to trick them into thinking they were call out priorities in the hope that trauma team could provide them with regular treatment for their wounded team members due to the nature of their work. Due to the recent events in recent years, these trauma teams would undergo an image change as well, not really by choice, but because they had to due to how the world had changed them. The teams would now swap out their basic blue and yellow uniforms that had displayed their compassion to their fellow man, and now they would be heavily armed to allow them to deal with anything on their job. These trauma team workers, almost troopers at this point, would all operate using extremely advanced and protective arms. They would go on to fly into a medical emergency with the latest and greatest in flight engineering, that being their own new TTI medical AV4A, which would be an extremely lightweight aerodyne that could get in and out of tight spaces with ease, and had heavily protected armor on it to make sure that if any were to be attacked, it could hold off from the heaviest gunfire it might experience. With that said, they won't exactly run from a fight if they need to, as the AV will be heavily armed with a front-mounted Gatling gun, as well as 7.62 saw machine guns, which are mounted to the sides of the vehicle in which the security specialist would be sitting by, with mobile tanker trucks and the ground refueling station coming with them as backup. Within this team would be the main pilots, with the co-pilot sitting next to them working the front-mounted Gatling gun, with neither of these individuals leaving the Aerodyne at any moment, ready to go at any moment's notice and fire at anyone who does not comply with their methods and requests. Behind the pilots are the security specialists who as mentioned will watch over the vehicle with their saw machine guns and then directly behind them are the actual EMTs who would go on to do the actual extraction operation and would be the main medical staff on the scene. If the operation does look a bit dodgy or risky, the security team will escort the EMTs out of the vehicle and will clear a path for them utilizing their rifles and submachine guns, and will most of the time not really fire them. They are just there to intimidate anyone in their way. However, they will kill anyone or massively wound them if they try anything and will just leave them to die. To the Trauma Team Corporation, the Hippocratic Oath doesn't really mean anything at this point. They are there to help the client that has called them out for assistance. If they have to kill non clients clients to get to them, so be it. Keeping the peace is not really their job. They are a corporation after all. Not only that, but their respect from their fellow man has gone at this point. What was once the comfort of trauma team coming in to help people was now a group of heavily armed, overworked, harried, angry and impatient workers who would not deal with anyone kindly anymore. They were at the end of their tether with the citizens thanks to how much bloodshed they had seen on a regular basis. By the end of this year, Trauma Team International had been reduced massively and now went under the branding of simply Trauma Team North America, which would be in independent franchise-owned groups that would patrol cities and respond to insured victims once again. Because of this change in business model, the corporation couldn't charge what it once did, and during 2045, a new planning scheme went ahead with only two covers available to people. For the corporate cops of America, they would be given special treatment, allowing them to have full medical coverage by trauma team. For anyone else, they had the choice between silver coverage and executive coverage. Silver coverage was exactly the same as the standard membership from 2020, 
2020, where it would cost the client 500 euro dollars per month. But if the client needed surgery, they would then have to cover the cost for what they went under. With that said, however, if a client did not want to pay extra for hospital treatments, the trauma team would do everything in their paramedical abilities to help them before dropping the member off at a hospital, which would most likely force the client to have to pay regardless. For the executive cover, it was relatively the same thing. It cost 1,000 euro dollars a month and included all the same things as the silver coverage. However, the only difference this time was the client on this plan would not have to pay for any surgery treatments. Essentially, 2045 brought about a system which many in America could afford compared to what they offered back in the 2020s. However, with that said, thanks to the recent war, many people were now homeless and jobless and still could not afford the treatment. And even if they could, the treatment trauma team offered now was filled with contempt. The loving medics that were once around within the 2020s had turned to almost soldiers who were only doing their job and their clients were just there to make money for their corporation. For 30 years, Trauma Team continued as a small organization until it got to a point within 2077 where finally they had enough resources to set up as Trauma Team International once again, allowing them to regain all of their previous assets lost within the fourth corporate war. This didn't mean that the world had changed, however, as once again gangs were on the rise and the crime rate was skyrocketing. Due to this rising crime, Trauma Team International could once again raise the pricing of their services and with the rising price Prices, would once again equip their teams with the latest weaponry and machinery by Kang Tao, more substantial than what they had within the year of 2020, including things such as some of the most sophisticated reviving and life support technology available, some of the best the world had ever seen, including a mobile cryo tank that they could use to keep the clients safe if they are in a critical condition and give them enough time to get back to the med center without the client dying. Within Night City and many other cities during this point, trauma teams would now be a equipped with the Trauma Team Atlas AV, which would be a flagship product of Zeta Tech and the most popular AV model used within Night City. This AV would be extremely sleek in design and extremely dependable, meaning the Trauma Team would never have to worry about their equipment failing on them when they are out on calls. Now that Trauma Team were back up to full strength, their new pricing was revealed with them now having three types of packages, but for all paying customers, they would receive on the ground services, which would include 24 seven emergency AV dispatch with a reflex booster ready pilot, armed safety experts and military trained paramedics. However, to make sure their clients were being genuine and the emergency was necessary, all of their clients' health would be tracked by internal cyberware and if their signal was to show that they were in need of assistance, an AV squad would use their cyberware to locate them and would arrive on the scene in minutes. Although it is not specified how long exactly that would be, however it is stated that that would be down to how much they were paying for their service. Inpatient care would be on top of that and would guarantee that every trauma team branch clinic would be equipped with surgical nanites, specialized antibodies, and cryogenic chambers. They would also offer their own medication and reanimators and would own a selection of surplus implants, which they would gain from their suppliers. As for the plans, however, they would be classed as premium packages. These packages would be color coded and would be silver, gold, and platinum. For most, the gold and silver were exactly like that of the services provided in 2020 and 2045. However, the most significant package would be the Platinum, which would offer everything you could wish for. This would include 24-7 monitoring, emergency patient transport, surgery and nanosurgery, post-trauma rehabilitation, plastic surgery on demand, free checkups with the client's ripper dog, and up to 90% discount of prescriptions. And on top of all of that, they would be guaranteed a three-minute response time to make sure nothing bad happened to the client. Prices are not really known at this point. However, it's safe to assume anyone on the Platinum package would be paying something similar to €34,000 a month, if not even more at that point. For everyone else, they will be allowed a free 24-hour trial for Trauma Team's premium packages for if they cannot afford it in the long run. However, if they do use it, that will be it, and they will never be looked after again by Trauma Team unless they pay. For the most part, this is the norm for all within North America and some countries. Trauma team are there to care for their paying clients. However, they are far more ruthless with how they treat them and others around them. But that isn't to say that the people still respect trauma team as was found with the EMT within Night City in the year of 2077 named Nadia. 
In summary, the trauma team are some of the best medical experts out there, but their job is far more than that, and they are always at risk of being killed wherever they go. The paying client is their priority, and if that means they lost two, three, four, or two whole squadrons to save a platinum client, so be it. That is the job at hand. Will the corporation continue to expand out in the future, or will it once again be affected by the world events around it? Only time can really tell. But for now, this has been the story of the medical corporation of Trauma Team. Moving closer into Night City itself is one of the last corporations out there, which is arguably not a megacorp, but does hold enough power to affect everything within Night City itself. That is their own police force known as the NCPD. For years starting from 1994, around the same time as the data crash, the NCPD were your standard police service within Night City, offering up every standard service you'd come to expect from the boys in blue. With so much going on within Night City and throughout all of America, these officers were massively overworked, criminally underpaid, and stress ran throughout the ranks as they desperately tried to combat all of the gangs plaguing the city, as well as things like random moments of street crime and even trying to clear up up the homelessness problem. With so much to do, their main headquarters would be located in the heart of the city within Little China by the year of 2020, setting up a maximum security facility that was seen as equal to any federal prison in the US, which was constructed on the site of the original Southside Police Precinct Number 3. A quite unique police headquarters this was as well, as within the basement of the facility was a fallout shelter, which also contained an armory and weapon repair station a 70-foot firearm range and four evidence storage vaults, as well as many other state-of-the-art pieces of equipment and rooms to make sure they had everything they needed to battle all forms of crime in their precious city. And during the year of 2020, NCPD was successful in keeping the downtown streets fairly safe. Although it must be said that due to Night City's extremely lax views on the public owning firearms, a lot of their problems were solved by the good citizens who wanted to take matters into their own hands. So a lot of the time the NCPD didn't have to get involved at all. It is unknown what exactly happened to the NCPD in general during the years that followed 2020, but considering how many times corporations, gangs and other parties got involved in the city, it was pretty safe to say that their whole presence certainly dwindled, especially during the fourth corporate war. And by the time of the unification war in 2069, the NCPD really were just a shadow of what they once were, trying desperately to control control everything going on within their city, but with Militech and the NUSA moving into their borders, there wasn't much a city police department could really do if there was to be a full-blown invasion. Luckily for the NCPD, they did not have to bring in their best ranks and equipment as Arasaka came to save the day and pushed Militech and the NUSA back, bringing an end to the war, bringing power and safety back to the people of Night City. As the 2070s got into full swing, the Pacifica region reached the boiling point. Now with Without all of its investors, gangs flooded it in their masses, making the most out of its high quality clubs, accommodation and building resources that were just left there completely abandoned. The NCPD saw this as a criminal offence and knew they had to try and step in to secure everything in the area that was once going to be one of the best tourist destinations in North America. But unfortunately, as the NCPD started to enter the Pacifica region, they saw how many gangs had taken the area, which included ex-Militech soldiers and realised there was no way they were going to be able to take it, seeing that it would just end in a complete bloodbath. With this, the chief of the NCPD, most likely Claudia Feldman at the time, ordered the withdrawal from the area and with it also got the Night City Council to shut down all city services there to force the locals to leave, which also turned out to be a complete failure. At some point during 2074, Cyber Psycho's presence started to get worse for the people of Night City, with regular attacks occurring in the heavily populated areas. One specific event happened within Kabuki, which went on to cause the deaths of three citizens. As Night City and the NCPD started panicking about these events, the NUSA got involved once again, with President Rosalind Myers offering her Militech services to help them clear up their problems and bring back order to the city once again. However, the NCPD commissioner saw right through this offer, knowing that if they accepted their help, they could take over their city from 
from within, and Night City would lose its independence and become an NUSA state. And with that, sharply criticized Myers' plans and outright refused her help, stating that the NCPD and Night City could handle it on their own. Two years following, in 2076, it became clear to the Night City Council that the NCPD was simply not profitable at all in their eyes. It was costing an absolute fortune for the government, and in the end, crime was still as large as ever. Something needed to change and fast. With this, the NCPD was transferred to private ownership to make sure it could finally bring in some eddies to help Night City's funding. At this same time, the chief of the NCPD would go on to be replaced by a data term sales executive named Jerry Falter, who to many who would see him on TV or about would think he was a smart businessman. But behind the scenes, he was incredibly corrupt, doing regular dealings with gangs and even being in a close friendship with the leader of the main gang of the Bargas from the Pacifica district named Kurt Hansen. Rumor had it that at some point in his role on the post, Jerry conspired with Maelstrom gang member Alexandra Seitovsva to lure officer Reggie Loeb and his partner into an ambush for being too proactive in their investigations and also organizing the elimination of homeless people with scavenger member Yelena Sidrova in a development project in Northside. But Jerry didn't just stop there. When becoming the police commissioner, he would also go on to save money the best way he knew how, by getting rid of half of the officers, reducing patrols, and ordered the beat cops to prioritize writing tickets only leading to even more crime on the streets. With now half of the police gone due to severe budget cuts, Jerry would go on to launch a drone for cops replacement program, launching more AI officers, meaning he could have crime control without having to really pay anything for it. And on top of that, would set up a new five euro dollar per minute phone charge for anyone making 911 phone calls to make sure the phone lines weren't jammed with unwanted calls and also make a fortune out of people by keeping them on hold or not really helping them when on the line. Private prisons became a thing as well, helping bring more money into the NCPD and by the end of the year, their finances got better but still not great, clearing some of their debt and getting them one step closer to clearing it all. This looked okay for a while, but when the year turned to 2077, the NCPD's finances took a plunge again by 17% and as a result, Mayor Lucius Ryan started to get involved trying to come up with a new solution to what he claimed was the police problem. And here he would go on to bring in corporate security firms to help police Night City instead. Security firms such as Arasaka, Kang Tao and even Biotechnica. By the mid-2077s, crime was still at an all-time high, helped massively thanks to Jerry Falter's corrupt ways of dealing with gangs and dangerous criminals. Pacifica had become completely abandoned by the NCPD officers. And if they did linger in the area like some officers did, such as Sasha Yakovlev, Bill Mitchell and Charles Wilson, they would be at the mercy of Kurt Hansen and his Bargast officers. And if they were to disobey or go against their wishes, they would be hunted down and killed if the need arose, showing who truly had the power within this part of Night City. But it wasn't just here. Out within the north side industrial district of Watson and the Badlands, the NCPD had no presence as well, mainly due to those massive officer cuts, but also because for the higher ups in Night City, they simply did not care of those areas and just let the people living there deal with it for themselves. If you were to live within Night City in the year of 2077, the best places to live would be within the corporate city centre and Westbrook, with Haywood and Santo Domingo being relatively safe but still pretty hostile. But despite everything listed here about how much the NCPD is struggling now, they still have clear roles for the officers who are still adamant that they can make a change throughout the city with some serious worries for anyone who might break the rules, especially in the NCPD hotspots. The main cops on the streets would be known as the patrol officers, who would be seen as the backbone of the NCPD and most police forces around the country. Their goal was relatively simple. They would patrol their given sector to enforce the law and try and reduce crime. Split into three sectors, there would be the beat patrol, the traffic patrol, and cruiser patrol. The beat patrol officers would be the boots on the ground, walking the streets and watching over their everyday public. Originally, these officers would go at it alone. However, due to how high crime is around the hold of Night City, the beat patrol now work in pairs to make sure they always have each other's backs in case a gunfight breaks out. Whilst it seems a simple job, it is extremely dangerous, as these simple beat officers will have to not 
not only report minor crimes such as theft or disturbances, but they will also have to try and tackle gangs, corporate shootouts, riots, drug deals, psychos, and other forms of violence. Essentially, they have to be on guard all of the time to deal with whatever gets thrown at them. Oh, and there's no backup for them. If there's reports of a gang war going on, those two officers will have to try and deal with it on their own and hope somehow the gangs either see sense or they can take them all out without any help from anyone else. They do have with them bulletproof vests, helmets, cuffs, first aid kits, a pistol, and maybe non-lethal launcher with them at all times, so their chances of survival are a bit higher thanks to that. Traffic Patrol have it a little easier, and actually many inside the NCPD consider it a lame job, and if you do get it, you are considered the lowest on the totem pole, or hated by your higher-ups, and it's been given to you as some form of punishment. Their job is simple, they manage traffic, give out tickets, watch people speed, and that's about it. But the problem is, no one likes them, not even other NCPD cops who see them as lessers. Regardless, traffic duty is still relatively dangerous and because of it they are issued with an armoured vest, traffic helmet and a 9mm pistol in case anyone tries to get out of paying a ticket or something else. The last of the patrol officers is the cruiser patrol who are seen as the top ranking in the patrol class. These officers will drive around in their BMW 600 which is known to them as a black and white and if a beat patrol officer is lucky they will see them and come to aid them if they have nothing else to do that day. But with that said, most of the officers won't get involved because let's be honest, they have the luxury of being sat down in the warmth behind some thick sheet metal, so nothing can really harm them. Most gangsters and petty criminals are scared of these officers because of their cruisers and also the fact that they have much better equipment to their arsenal. So if you do see a cruiser charging you down and you aren't equipped with good weaponry and protection, you know you will be in quite a bit of trouble. The next division within the NCPD is the investigation investigation department, which is much smaller in scale, but far more higher in stature, with some of the best operatives working within it. These include vice, robbery, homicide, and special investigations. The vice department primarily deals with narcotics, with an emphasis on trafficking, possession, and distribution, as well as other big crimes such as prostitution, gambling, and weapons crimes. The officers have a range of cybernetics that aid them with surveillance and then infiltration. This aids them in in their undercover operations which take place over a span of months. The vice department has managed to infiltrate some very dangerous gangs such as Maelstrom and the Scavs in operations that took place in some of the most horrible parts of the city. The robbery department obviously deals with any type of theft, including small household burglaries through to vehicle theft and armed robbery. It also deals with more insidious types of theft such as grand larceny, fraud, counterfeiting and embezzlement. In Night City this type of theft is rife and therefore a lot of money and resources are poured into the robbery department in order to minimize the damage of such crimes. Like with Vice, the robbery department spend a lot of time on long undercover missions, uncovering gangs and crime networks, but with such high level of theft related crimes, the robbery department also has a ton of paperwork to do, which is very time consuming and not to mention having to interrupt their operations to attend a sudden armed robbery where the police attend quickly guns at the ready to take down the latest perpetrators. Moving on from robbery, there is then the homicide department. Although this obviously deals with murders, this can come in many forms, including mass murders, serial killers, and the ever prevalent corporate murders sweeping through the city's competitive businesses. Indeed, the homicide department can deal with around 50 murders a day in Night City, making this department one of the busiest and most overworked, therefore leading to a poor arrest rate and many cases being unsolved solved and abandoned due to sheer volume and the need to prioritize. With very little being done about homicide, gangs and perpetrators are becoming more bold as they know they can get away with extreme violence. As a consequence of seeing such horrific scenes every day, the officers in homicide have become cold and distant with many experiencing psychological difficulties as well. Finally, we have the Special Investigations Department, which is also known as SIN. A special investigation is classed as a more large-scale and serious crime than those dealt with in vice, robbery and homicide, although there is some crossover. For example, a special investigation might also include a mass murder case or counterfeiting or corporate espionage. But what makes these cases special is they have to be a part of widespread and organized crime, essentially cases that are too big or complex for the other departments to 
to have the time or resources to deal with. However, this leads to some discourse between the other departments and Sin, as Sin receives more funding and can often take over a case completely with little regard for the officers that have already worked on them. Moving on from the investigations division, we have the tactical division. The tactical division exists to take over from the investigations department for when a situation escalates and reinforcements are needed when investigating has reached the end of its usefulness. The tactical division is divided into three departments. These are SWAT, MaxTac and Riot. I won't be going into too much detail about MaxTac as I've already done a video on them, but to give the gist I will just say that they deal primarily with cyber psychos and are officially called the Cyborg Suppression Unit or the Psycho Squad. They deal with everything that is above what the SWAT team deal with. For the SWAT, which stands for Special Weapons and Tactics, they are trained to deal with high-risk situations and situations which involve heavy weaponry that ordinary police officers just do not have the equipment, resources or know-how to deal with. These are situations such as hostage rescue, shootouts and sieges. The SWAT department also provides security for high-profile clients or places that could attract particularly nasty attacks and crimes. The SWAT department are equipped with their own special tactical police vehicles and have access to as many combat cybernetics that they could possibly ever need. Finally, in the tactical division, we have the riot department, which is slightly self-explanatory in that they are there to deal with riots, but they have to take a different approach to that of the SWAT department. Unlike them, the riot department can't use excessive force and have to pacify situations by other means than instantly meeting violence with violence. The riot department are on call 24-7 for any flare-ups in Night City, and they work in teams of 10 riot officers armed with protective equipment such as riot shields and ballistic armor and crowd dispersal equipment like tear gas, tasers and non-lethal ammunition. Although the main aim is pacification, the NCPD has a policy of if you don't want to get hurt, don't riot, which sounds simple enough to me. Over into the other territories, the NCPD actually patrol the net as well, despite many believing it is only Netwatch who police it. Here the net security section, also known as NetSec, makes sure the net within Night City is patrolled and kept safe and that specific city data does not leave that area. This team will hunt down daring criminal netrunners and also just keep regular checks going to make sure everything is up to date and safe. But there is also another side to this group. Here they have their own netrunners who are part of this organization who they use to dive into the net to seek out important information about dodgy corporate dealings, gang operations and also gathering as much information on certain subjects they believe to be part of a big crime within the city. This is extremely rare to ever see and many of the cops will never get any information from NetSec but if they do it will more often than not completely make the case and help lock up the culprits once and for all. The only big problem with this division is the NetSec officers are usually extremely high strung and are allowed into the NCPD without any training whatsoever which really ticks off many within the force. Being scouted out similar in style to corp cops when these members do join NetSec they will be given access to top level software and hardware, enabling them to become extremely proficient in their chosen area of net running. Without this group, the NCPD's arrest rate would be far lower than it already is. This division really is a sign that despite low funding, they have some of the best equipment and people to deal with the criminals living within. Internal Affairs is another division of the NCPD, but all of the regular officers see them as the bane of their existence. This group of individuals will not investigate crimes going on with citizens but they will instead investigate the officers if they have been given reports about them committing gross misconduct in the pursuit of their duties or being corrupt, dangerous or performing any other activities which abuses their position and endangers the department as a whole. For the IAD they have the ability to completely remove officers once and for all from their duties and can even make up evidence just to get rid of some of the officers they do not like. But most of the time if an officer is to suspended or kicked out of the force, it will be IAD that was behind it. And with that done, the rest of the force, including your own friends and close partners, will know that you are a dirty cop and will never speak to you 
or work with you ever again, unless they're corrupt as well. The final division is the most boring one out there, simply being the administration, which is key for the NCPD to keep functioning. These guys are just desk jockeys, making sure all arrests and reports are processed and that all evidence has been reported correctly. The only time anyone really wants to work in admin is when they've been involved in a horrifying gunfight, have got injured or simply just doesn't want to do any groundwork anymore. But if you were to work in admin for too long, you will never be regarded as a true officer and hold little to no prestige among the other officers in the organization. With all of these divisions covered, it does sound awfully like the NCPD are extremely well equipped despite all of the massive budget cuts made by their commissioner. And this would also be shown within their equipment side of things where, despite once again their budget cuts, the NCPD owns some of the most state-of-the-art equipment to deal with the criminals in the city. This is mainly seen at the high end of the organization where they will own the latest automatic weapons and a Militech M10AF Lexington sidearm as well as other industry standard weapons. For MaxTac they have some of the best armor you have ever seen with cybernetics being a requirement for all of their members with some owning Mantis blades and arm launchers to combat anyone that gets in their way. The NCPD have also recently procured some of Militech's incredible Centaur exoskeletons which some lucky patrol officers get given. MaxTac already own these but with a few police having them as well it means they can tackle crime much easier even if there is a limited supply. Not only do they own exoskeletons but Militech have also sold the NCPD their famous Minotaur mechs which patrol the city as well with other drones that their commissioner is all for. Those being the Militech Wyverns, Griffins, Arasaka Robot RMK2 patrol robots and Zeta Tech Bombus drones to add to their ranks without having to worry about if they get ill or damaged because unlike humans these drones and robots can always be brought back meaning it is an endless stream of troops that they also don't have to pay a regular salary. With all of this spelt out about how the NCPD works you would think that a lot are proud to be members of this team helping save citizens from the endless waves of crime within the city but the truth is every officer is massively overworked barely getting a wage. In recent years the wrong type of people have also joined the service just to assert their power on the people of the city with one being quoted as saying why did I become a cop? Well when push comes to shove I like to be the one doing the pushing. You can push real hard with a hurricane assault shotgun. Some officers still feel like they really can make a true difference to their city and will go out of their way to help citizens in dire straits. But with corruption running all the way to the top and no light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to hitting back against crime a lot are losing their morale and have just gone straight into the mindset of just shutting up and getting on with whatever they get told to do. To this day the NCPD still have a pretty strong presence over the neon city however that's not to say they are the only ones that control the streets. That ultimately is the role of the corporations now who hold so much power that they can initiate crime, handle hostile gangs and keep the peace with their own militaries and corporate cops. The NCPD technically are a corporation now being primarily funded by Night Corp but behind the scenes both the megacorps of Arasaka and Militech still pull the strings and organize them to do things for their benefit. The force also has a massive problem when it comes to solving its own cases. Despite having so many parts of its organization to fight crime, in the year of 2077 it will hire out mercs who will get the job done for them, obtaining the evidence that is either under corporate jurisdiction that forbid any police presence or is just far too hostile to risk sending under-equipped officers into. But with all of that said, maybe the NCPD aren't the best police force in the world, but they are all that Night City have to try to control crime in the area. Maybe in the future the NCPD will deal with its corrupt leadership and become a real force for good, and the gangs and corrupt corporations will become a thing of the past for the ordinary Night City citizens. For now though, this has been an in-depth look at the crime fighters of the neon metropolis of Night City. This is the story of the NCPD. And finally we have the Megacorp of Zeta Tech, which unfortunately not much is known about them apart from all of the information from the corporate wars. However if the NUSA's operation were to be successful within Night City, ridding the world of Kurt Hansen and his Bargast operation, Zeta Tech would rise to power massively along with Militech, most likely with them combining together to advance the tech market. By 2079 Zeta Tech offices would be set up all over Night City with their main headquarters being located there. 
These stores would show some of the most advanced pieces of cyberware the world had ever seen, and on top of that, even the NCPD looked to have benefited from their technology. This would unfortunately mean that a lot of independent businesses would lose their stores and livelihoods as their megacorps would grow day by day. It's most likely that Zeta Tech are doing exactly what Kang Tao are doing and benefiting from the struggles of other corporations dropping off the map, especially as at this point in time, Arasaka are no more within Night City. But this could lead to hostilities again, as rumor has it that within 2079, Zeta Tech are at war with Petrochem over vital resources and land, and it's only a matter of time before another corporate war takes off, maybe involving the new guys of Zeta Tech and Kang Tao, but only time will really tell. But for now though, this has been all of the stories of the megacorps from the cyberpunk universe and how they came to become so powerful over the many years. I want to say a huge thank you if you have made it to this part of the video and I can't thank you enough for the support you have given this channel with all of the cyberpunk love. I want to say a big shout out to my supporters over on Patreon and YouTube who help fund this channel and allow me to make videos on a regular basis, including my small fishes, my big fishes, Greg and Noxvox, my YouTube channel Wise Ones, Video Gamer 75 and Sith Lord 906, my sharks Alfred Correa and Jason X117, and my Megalodons, Bad Clams 83, Hazy Thoughts and Sinus. If you want to support this channel, the links are down below, including some of my merch, which I'm pretty happy with. So please check it out and see what you think of it. And also check out the audio version over on Spotify and other podcast suppliers. But that is all for now. Thank you for watching again. Please do like, comment and subscribe to help get them out there. And finally, with all of that said, I shall see you all in the next one. Cheers.